walking in an orderly manner through the nearest available exit and make your way to the Asda car park at the front of the building. Please, can I ask that the live stream is started and verbal confirmation is provided. Yes, so Mr Chairman, the live stream has been started. For those online, welcome to the, the, this meeting of the Planning and Regulatory Committee. The agenda, papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council website. Please remember that your, your words and actions should be chosen carefully and members are reminded that speeches are limited to three minutes. The Council is streaming this meeting live on the Herefordshire Council YouTube channel and also making a recording. The recording will be available via the Council's website shortly after this meeting has been concluded. Other attendees are permitted to film, photograph and record the meeting, provided that it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. If you do not wish to be filmed or photographed, please identify yourself so that everyone who intends to record the meeting can be made aware. To ensure that the quality is maintained, should members speak, could members speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum and ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent. Welcome to all those in attendance. I now ask Mr Banks to reintroduce all the officers. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name's Andrew Banks. Uh, I'm a Development Manager for Herefordshire Council, um, and I'll be supporting um, the members in making their decisions today. Um, to my left, sorry, to my right even, um, I have Ollie Jones, uh, who will be presenting items six and eight. Item seven will be um, presented by Simon Rowles, um, and item 10 by Jack Dyer. Um, we also have legal support uh, with us today via um, the computer screen um, from Kerry Munro um, and highway advice from Katie Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Item one, apologies for absence. We have received apologies from Councillor Bolter, Councillor Johnson, and Councillor Provert. Item two, name substitutes. Councillor Shaw is acting as a substitute for Councillor Johnson, and Councillor Stone is acting as a substitute for Councillor Probert. Chairman, could I also add Councillor Davis, Claire Davis, to that list, please? Yeah, Councillor Davis also sends her apologies. Declarations of interest. Please indicate if you wish to declare an interest and then I will call each councillor in turn. Are there any declarations of interest? There are none. The minutes. To confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 15th of March, 2023, no matters of accuracy have been notified to the monitoring officer. Are the minutes of the meeting of the 15th of March, 2023 approved? Please, all members. Right, that is agreed. Any anyone against? No, that is carried. Under Chairman's mandates, all I have to announce is the fact that the agenda item ten has been deferred for in no, nine. Sorry, nine for further information. We'll now move on to the first application. Can I request the public speakers present in person for the agenda of six of the meeting? Mr. Watkins, local resident. Mr. Foley, the applicant. Please take a seat in the public participation table. Good morning. I welcome you to the meeting and will call you to speak following the officer's presentation of the application. The application is land to the north of School Road, Carrington, Herefordshire. Uh, outland planning commission for six dwellings, all matters reserved from the act, uh, apart from the access. We'll now go to the officer's presentation. Thank you very much, Chairman, and good morning to members. Can check everyone can hear okay? Yeah. 
Uh, so good morning members, thank you for those who attended the committee site visit yesterday. Hopefully it proved useful in contextualising the site and its surroundings. Since the publication of the agenda and reports pack, officers have received what is considered a further representation from a local resident. This raises concerns with respect to flooding from the Tarrington Brook to the north of the site. This is presented within the committee update sheet before members. Officers can advise that it introduces no new material plan considerations which have not otherwise been considered. In addition, the update sheet also includes the latest comments from the authorities' land drainage team in verbatim. While these are referred to in the body of the officer report, um, they are omitted from the, the consultation section. And um, I will just note here, um, following a query on the site visit yesterday, um, I can confirm that the agricultural land keep, uh, classification of the site is grey to so slash very good. So the application before members this morning is made an outline with all matters reserved for access. It seeks plan permission for up to, up to six dwellings at land to the north of School Road, Tarrington. As explained within the officer's report, the application has been subject to successive material <coughs> changes throughout, with a number of dwellings being revised down throughout the course of the application. The application would include a single point of vehicle access taken from School Road, it would also comprise improvements to the public right of way, including the provision of a short footway linking the westbound bus stop at the Tarrington Arms. These elements of the proposal, comprising permanent alterations and improvements to the public highway, would be subject to a Section 278 agreement between the developer and the local highways authority. Um, just to note as well, in recognition that the application was submitted to the local planning authority in 2018, it is important at this stage to advise members that until now it has not been possible to progress the application positively through a habitat regulations assessment due to the unfavourable condition of the River Lug, which forms part of the River Y SAC. Um, but I will touch and uh, explain as to the change of circumstances relating to this later in the presentation. So in terms of the site, it's marked on the slide by the red star, it comprises land to the north of School Road, Tarrington. School Road is a minor road which runs through Tarrington, in essence looping around from its junction with the 8438 adjacent to the Tarrington Arms, before rejoining 430 metres to the west, just to the south of a small farm complex known as the Old Dairy. Do the next slide, please. So this slide shows the red edge of the application site, in essence lying within the settlement but comprising a wider parcel of irregularly shaped agricultural land laid to pasture. The site is bound to the south by School Road, to the east by the Tarrington Brook and Church View. To the north and west of the site is bound by the wider parcel of agricultural land in which the site forms part of, but further residential development and the community hall Stroud School Road to the west. Next slide please. So you can see the application site again, edged in red, and then all other land owned by the applicant in blue. It's worth noting the application sites include the entirety of the public, public right of way from its junction with School Road up to, up to where it meets the A438 <coughs> adjacent to the Tarrington Arms. So that's why um, the, the shape of the, uh, the site is slightly um, irregular. Next slide, please. So this slide is taken from the Tarrington NDP and it's useful for contextualising the site in terms of its relationship and positioning with the rest of the village and indeed with regards to the key constraints. So you'll be able to make out Tarrington settlement boundary is edged in black. The application site in this case forms one allocated for housing within the Tarrington NDP, totalling approximately 0.65 hectares. <coughs> You also see that the map indicates the route of the public right of way running north to south with the purple dashed line just to the left to the west of the site. <coughs> and I've also just indicatively added to the map listed buildings, which is marked by the red stars, and also a group tree preservation order 
that's shown in green and takes in a number of trees, which essentially form a narrow valley dingle um, along the Tarrington Brook to the immediate east of the site, adjacent to the rear of Church View. Um, and Church View is a small development of four dwellings, which were granted by permission in the early 2000s um, and are access to the west of School Road. Next slide, please. Here we have an indicative proposed site plan. It's important to emphasise to members that the application is made in outline with all matters bar access reserved for future consideration. And as such, it is purely illustrative bar the means of access. It simply seeks to demonstrate how a development of six houses could come forward on the site. And the next slide, please. So we'll just run through some photos of the site. Um, I've added a location plan in the bottom right cor hand corner, which should just help to illustrate where the photo um, was taken in, in context of the site. So is it is it possible to drop the box? We can we just go to the first one. That's great. Um, so just looking eastwards here along School Road. So the side line to the left. Next one, please. So a key characteristic of the site is its topography. It's somewhat so problematic in illustrating that through photos alone, um, but in essence, the site is positioned with a, within a parcel of land <coughs> that forms a dome shape. It rises to a rounded peak roughly in the northwestern part of the site where the photo is taken and then drops to the east towards the boundary to, with the church view and Tarrington Brook and southwards to, towards School Road and then here looking northwards along the public right of way and you've got the 8438 just out of sight um, in the distance. Next slide please. So this shows it slightly clearer looking along the public right of way to the north of the site. Um, worth noting the sort of current status of the public right away in its condition, but is sort of as you would expect in a rural settlement, um, but clearly not currently conducive to the use um, by some reasonable pedestrian in terms of connectivity to the bus stop, which lies um, at, at sort of on the next hedgerow line where the A438 is. Uh, next slide, please. So this is looking sort of essentially from the same point at the northern end of the site in the east of church view and again you can somewhat make out the land falling away to the right the south back towards school road away from the crest of the site and the Tarrington brook running um, between the site of church view and you can make out, make out some of those trees um, that are subject to that tree preservation order next slide please that's just that without a map, so it shows the topography slightly clearer. <coughs> um, so again, this one, not showing an awful lot, but it does indicate again the topography, topography of the site. The area forming the allocation site and the area for housing is that in the foreground. Um, and essentially forming the sort of southeastern parcel, portion of the wider parcel of land. I think the next one's the same, but without a map. Next slide. Um, this is looking west from the same position, land rising again to the north and west, and then you can make out the well-established boundary with, um, with School Road to the left-hand side. Uh, next one, please. So this is taken out with the red edge, but looking into the southeastern portion and the area proposed for development existing boundary to the east and church view again the land falling away towards the Tarrington Brook. Next one please. Again this is just the southeastern corner. So church view to the left to the east and then school road behind um, the hedgerow. Um, next one. So this is looking south towards the boundary along School Road. Again, you also make out the public right of way just to the right. 
Um, so. Okay, so that's just the Eastern Bangladesh site again, a church view, showing the, the relationship there. Um, and again, the brook, the Darrington Brook runs down below. And that's all good. So, as I mentioned, this is the far northern extremity of the application site and where the public right of way meets the A438. Um, I know we didn't go down here yesterday, but at present it exits essentially immediately onto the West Bank carriageway of the A438. And look at the next one. So essentially immediately behind this existing but run redundant West Bank bus stop is where the public right of way emerges. Um, so there's not really any safe refuge for pedestrians at present. But members will note in the foreground the existing footway running to the redundant bus stop. And then I think the last photo is such as shows the relatively new westbound bus stop adjacent to the Tarrington Arms and set back off the A438. So the proposal would look to remove the existing bus stop and provide a safe footway with gated access from the field to allow access to that new westbound bus stop. And next slide, please. Okay. So, in terms of the main issues, these are covered within the officer's report, but can be summarised here. As members will be aware, the application must be considered in accordance with the development plan, unless any other material considerations indicate otherwise. The development plan in this location comprises the Herefordshire Local Plan Core Strategy and also the Tarrington Neighbourhood Development Plan, NDP. The latter being adopted on the 14th of April 2022, following a successful referendum on the 17th of March 2022. So the application site in this case lies within the settlement boundary for Tarrington, which on the next slide please, as drawn by the Tarrington NDP edged in black on the map and within which there is principal support for new housing development. More so, and as mentioned, the application site comprises an, allocated, an allocation for residential development through policy TR8 within the NDP, and this is shade of brown on the map. The pretext of the policy advised that the site has a capacity for around six dwellings, and the application site comprises the entirety of the area as indicated, but it does also include the public right of way from its junction with School Road up to the A438. The quantum of development proposed has been revised down from the maximum of 15 previously proposed down to up to six dwellings as now proposed. In principle, and as explained within the Office report, there are considered to be no reasons at this stage which would suggest that a scheme for six dwellings could not be comfortably accommodated on the site. It's been recognised that the southeastern portion of the site and of the wider land holding is notably less sensitive in terms of landscape and heritage constraints. In terms of concerns raised with respect to the scale, nature and affordability of housing which would come forward on the site, it's not possible to secure affordable housing given the development is for less than 10 dwellings. That said, condition 5 would ensure that any forthcoming reserve matters application proposes suitable mix of housing which reflects the latest housing market area needs assessment. Next slide, please. So in terms of landscape, members will appreciate the site, excluding the element relating to the public right of way, is now contained to the southeastern portion of the whole land holding, closest to church view and school road. Because of the topography, this would limit any inter and co-visibility with longer distance vantage points to the north. The revised application has been retracted in its extent considerably from when the application was originally submitted for up to 15 dwellings. So on the slide you again, will again be able to see the area to the north of the site where the land starts to fall away. Um, I think if we go to the next slide it would be useful to compare the material change in the quantum of development now proposed um, and how it's been retracted. So these are purely indicative but it is useful in illustrating the quantum of built form on the site and how this has changed throughout the course of the application. So on the left is what was initially deposited to the local planning authority, so it's for up to 15 dwellings. And when you compare that to what we're now considering, which is the scheme for up to six, as depicted through the 
illustrative site layout to the right. Um, it is obviously as it, important to emphasize that these are purely illustrative and simply demonstrate how the development could come forward um, within the extent of the site and the allocation. Um, but from a landscape perspective, the landscape officer has confirmed that a scheme which is contained within the site for up to six dwellings um, within the allocated site to the southeastern portion is acceptable, subject to any reserve matters application taking on board the comments made with respect to the layout and scale of the dwellings, together with a requirement for it to be landscape led to ensure that the development respects the rural and verdant setting of the village. Next slide, please. And again, quite similarly, with respect to the historic environment, as set out again within the officer's report, the site does lie within close proximity to a number of designated heritage assets, which include the Grade 2 listed Old Rectory, which sits at lower elevation to the north of the wider parcel, access to the west of School Road, and the church, which members will have um, been able to see yesterday. There is a degree of interim co visibility again between the site and the church, given the topography. Um, on the next slide, there is a photo. So again, it's the same one, but it just shows that further to the north, um, the site that the land is more exposed and there is increased interim co visibility with heritage assets um, and, the, and the wider landscape. Um, but again, from a heritage perspective, although the conservation team have raised concerns with, with respect to developing land to the north of the site, as previous as previously proposed, officers are now confident that a suitably considered reserve matter scheme could come forward on the site without causing any unweighed harm to the, to the setting of heritage assets. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and again, in, in terms of residential immunity, in terms of the proposal's impact on the relationship between the site and neighbouring prop prop um, properties, so church view. It again would be for any forthcoming reserve mass application to demonstrate that there would be no unacceptable impact in terms of the change in, in residential relationship. But given the size of the site and the, the existing boundary treatment, officers are confident that there would be no insurmountable impact. This would not be insurmountable rather um, when, when taking into account the other constraints of the site. Um, moving on to the access and highways implications of the scheme. As explained within the officer report, there is has been some local concern raised with respect to the impact of the proposal on the safety of the local highway network, specifically noting the use of school road by pedestrians and with the absence of football, with existing footway provision, the increased potential for conflict. The proposal in this case would take access from school road as required by the policy relating to the allocated site within the Tarrington NDP and the appropriate facility displays are, would be secured through condition 15, as recommended um, um, within the report. Then move to the next slide, please. So, as also expected, in terms of the allocated site as set out within the Tarrington NDP, the proposal includes improvements to the public footpath between School Road and its junction with the A438, along, along with other off-site imp highway improvements on the A438, which would include a non-controlled Pedestrianised pedestrian crossing, so it's essentially a dropped curb um, to provide access to the eastbound bus stop, along with an extension to the footway to connect the existing westbound bus stop um, adjacent to the Tarrington Arms. Um, so, whilst these are shown on this plan, Condition 5 would secure the final details of this list to be submitted to the local planning authority once they've been agreed and secured through a Section 278 agreement which would um, essentially enable them to be adopted by the local highways authority. Um, next slide. <coughs> yeah. So again, you can just hear, see here the current footpath and sort of existing safety implications where it emerges onto the A438, which um, hopefully are obvious. Officers consider that with the improvements to the public right of way, which will connect the site to the bus stop as well as the Tarrington Arms. But the proposal should provide improved alternative options for existing and future occupiers within Tarrington. Members are reminded that paragraph 111 of the National Planning Policy Framework states that development should only be prevented or refused on highways grounds if there would be an unacceptable impact on highway safety, 
or the residual cumulative impacts on the road, road network would be severe. Subject to conditions which would include the securing of the details of the public right of way and the highways improvements, there is no objection from the local, high, local highway authority and the scheme is considered to accord with the relevant development plan policies in this regard. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of flooding and drainage, the site is located within an area at the lowest risk of flooding. As set out within the update, update sheet, in terms of the comments from the land drainage team, there is no principal objection subject to further details being supplied. In terms of surface water, there is a broad presumption that because of perceived localised ground conditions, infiltration methods would not be viable. And therefore, an attenuated system with control discharge to the Tarrington Brook has been indicatively proposed, as included on the illustrative site layout. This approach is considered acceptable in principle, subject to further details set out in the comments as, um, as provided by the Landry H team. However, that said, in accordance with the hierarchy as set out within policy SD3 relating to surface water, and in, uh, again set out in the comments from the Landry H team, any forthcoming surface water drainage strategy for the site should include results of infiltration, te infiltration testing to actually confirm whether or not infiltration method, method measures are viable or not. Should it not be viable and atten an attenuated system is required, details including infiltration testing results would be required to be submitted together with any reserve matter submission and this would ensure that the layout is considered together with the drainage strategy for the site. Um, I think if we flip to the next slide, members will be able to see that condition in terms of what we would be asking for and what we would expect. Um, so I'm not, I won't bother reading them out, but you will be able to see um, the, the sort of comprehensive nature of what would be required. And again, that would include ongoing maintenance and management and details of any measure, uh, any sort of infrastructure that would be adopted. Um, Um, in terms of foul water, this would be a mains connection as required, given that one is available. Although a pumping station has been indicatively proposed, as advised by Welsh Water and Land Drainage, gravity fed solutions to the northeast of the site should be explored in the first instance, as these may be possible. Um, next slide, please. And then, in terms of ecology, an updated preliminary, preliminary ecology appraisal has been supplied which the planning ecology team consider to be relevant and acceptable, subject to safeguarding conditions to secure the requisite ecological protection and working methods, restrictions on external illumination levels, as well as provision of biodiversity net gain measures. And then to just finish, members will be aware that the site lies within the hydrological catchment of the river lug, that forms part of the river Y SAC which is currently failing its conservation status as a result of phosphate levels. As such, because the application has not until present been able to demonstrate that it would not adversely affect the integrity of the designated site, the evidence it would be neutral, neutral, it has not been able to progress a positive habitat regulations assessment. Therefore, as being the case for a significant other number of applications for residential development across northern and central areas of the county, falling within the catchment, the application has in essence been placed on hold until a time whereby strategic offsetting solutions have been able to come forward. As set out within the officer's report, the applicant has applied for and received an allocation of phosphate credits from Herefordshire Council. <coughs> The purchase of these credits funds the delivery of the wetland project, which mitigates for the effect of their development and delivers net betterment to the lab. The amount of credits to be purchased is therefore commensurate with the level of impact which requires mitigation. This has been calculated by the, by the applicant using the usual neutrality budget calculator for the river lab. The figures have been reviewed by the planning ecology team, who have confirmed them to be accurate. This is followed uh, for a positive, appropriate assessment to be completed by the local planning authority responsible as the competent authority, and this has been submitted to Natural England for their comments. Natural England's response corroborates with the authority's conclusions insofar the proposed development would be made nutrient neutral, neutral by purchasing credits to the constructed wetland, and it is agreed that with this nutrient neutrality in place, there are no adverse effects on the integrity of the River Y SAC. As set out within the recommendation, this would be subject to the completion of a section 106 agreement to secure the purchase of phosphate credits to mitigate the effects of the development on the river lug 
riverwide SAC. So in conclusion, with regards to all of the above, and having regards to the relevant policies as contained within the development plan, the application is accordingly recommended for approval, subject to the completion of the Section 106 Turner Country Planning Act 1990 Obligation Agreement to secure the purchase of the requisite phosphate credits to mitigate for the effects of the development upon the River Lug YSAC. With that, the outline plan provision be granted, subject to the conditions as set out in the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for your exhaustive uh, report. I now invite Mr. Watkins, a local resident, to speak in objection to the application. You have three minutes. Now, Mr. Chairman and members, the topography of the site makes it unsuitable for development, and the high dome is deep south down to the brook. The development is too large and extends north and west, now includes the public footpath from School Road to the A438 and is in excess of the area included in the NTP, which specifically excluded the footpath, as this is part of the green area. The roadway extends to the north, suggesting that this is the first part of a larger development. The site now includes larger houses than previously, and they're in prominent positions high up the slope, with no attempt to be sympathetic to the setting of heritage properties close by. TAR 7, the NDP, require a smaller home, which is consistent with the results of the 2014 residence questionnaire. The Carney Tinkler Report, commissioned for the NDP steering group, stated that any development should avoid the high ridge to the west and northeast and be restricted to the southeastern corner, an area of 0.44 hectares, in order to mitigate harm to the landscape, the effect on heritage assets close by, and to protect the views into and out of the village and also from the footpath crossing the site. The Heritage Report carried out supported this, and it was also endorsed by the Planning Officer Ed Thomas when an earlier application was refused. The development would remove an important green area near the centre of the village and urbanise the school road and badly affect listed buildings and the approach to the village. The development would lead to the loss of a valuable wildlife habitat. Areas of undisturbed rough grass close to villages are now very rare. The footpath and the school road are used by many residents for recreational purposes, enjoying the green area in this part of the village. Development on the site and tarmacking the footpath would remove it from the green space and urbanise it, destroying the rural character. The site is wet and boggy. The proposed attenuation basin is insufficient to deal with the surface water runoff. The steep slopes will cause the basin to fill quickly during heavy rainfall, after which all the runoff will discharge directly to the brook, making the attenuation system ineffective, causing flooding in the centre of the village and also further north of Sparsh Farm. Residents are also concerned about pollution caused by sewage spills from the pumping station into the brook due to heavy rain, leaks, breakdowns and power cuts. The 2018 traffic survey was flawed as documented in the past and should be disregarded. There are very few facilities in Tarrington, so residents have to drive to work, education and for entertainment, etc. and will only use the footpath for leisure. Additional traffic from the site at peak times would make the school road junction to the A4 Street even more congested. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Just on time. Thank you. And now I invite Mr. Foley, the applicant, to speak in support of the application. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. My name is Rupert Foley, and I'm speaking on the owner of the application of the school road character. Uh, you'll note from the comprehensive. Can we up the volume, please, or use the microphone? Um, you prepared by the planning officer this application has been in the system for some time due to the phosphates affecting the large parts of the county. Um, I'm delighted to be within the first phase of applications to be offered phosphate credits. I know the council has worked very hard to bring phosphate credit scheme to fruition and to ensure that planning decisions can yet again be made in the affected areas. The application before you was originally submitted for up to 15 dwellings and the application has been through the Tarrington Neighbourhood Development Plan consultation process, independently examined by the planning inspector, and the site was allocated for six dwellings in the NTP. In response to this allocation, the number of units proposed was reduced in order to ensure compliance with 
Lay policy that now forms part of the adopted development plan. The National Planning Policy Framework states that planning applications should be made in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. In this instance, as noted in the officer's report, the proposal does accord with the plan. The application before you is submitted in outline and all matters reserved except for access. As noted in the officer's report, and so a six to an X is considered acceptable in accordance with TAR 8 of the Neighbourhood Development Plan and the Development Plan as a whole. And the principle of development is therefore deemed acceptable. Um, with regards to access, the Highways Department and the Planning Officer have concluded that the impact of the development on the road network will not be severe, and therefore the means of access is also acceptable. At this stage, there are no outstanding technical matters or objections. Whilst indicative site plans were submitted, <coughs> all matters relating to design, appearance, layout, and landscaping will be determined by the council at the reserve matter stage. They do not form part of this application and look forward to engaging with the council in the future on these matters. The officer's conclusions note that they are satisfied that an appropriate landscape and scheme can be delivered on this site without compromising the character of the village. The proposed development represents a sustainable location and proposal which will bring forward social, environmental, and economic <coughs> benefits to the local area. It is therefore respectively requested that members vote to support the officer's recommendation for approval. Thank you. Uh, can the speakers now turn to the public gallery? Councillor John Hardwick is the local mem ward member. He speaks first and then has the right to speak at the end of the debate. He does not have a, a vote. It's a 10 minute time limit. Councillor Hardwick. I don't believe it'll take me 10 minutes, Chairman. Um, Thank you for um, members attending the site visit yesterday. Um, I think it was uh, very important for members to view the topography of the site um, and the relationship of the site um, to the listed buildings, heritage buildings, including the church. Um, I would like to also thank Mr. Jones for a very, very thorough um, presentation, um, hence why I personally will not need to speak uh, for too long on this application. Um, <clears throat> as we've already heard, Carly Tinkler's landscape report, which was conducted um, for the May Neighbourhood Development Plan, made it very clear that any development on this proposed site should be restricted to a maximum of six and focused on the southeast edge of the, the site. Um, as we're aware, this is only an outline application, but it's clear from the illustration shown this morning that the proposals extend much further to the north than they perhaps should. I believe this application um, would have moved through the process much quicker had it been a full application rather than an outline in the first place. Uh, many of the objections um, I think would have been um, appeased if, if um, more detail initially was uh, provided. Should this up, uh, outline application be accepted this morning, I would uh, expect that the reserve matters application be also presented to planning committee for approval. Um, current indicative plan, as I've, I've already said, doesn't really address the landscape issues mentioned and the protection of the listed buildings and requires a housing mix um, that is suitable for the, the parish. Um, I'll leave it at that, Chairman, and uh, look forward to the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hardy. Can I now invite debate? Can I ask for any speakers, please? Councillor Bowen? Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, it was very valuable, I think, being there. as. I think any site visit is absolutely essential for 
well, almost any, any application, I think. It is much appreciated, and thank you very much indeed. Uh, I have certain reservations, I think that's, that probably many people have. Um, is the development boundary just around this particular site and will limit any development to this site? That's one question, please. Um, the footpath, uh, I think the idea of tarmacking it is, is not desirable in any way at all. I'm sure some form of type one surface or whatever, um, a stone, uh, draining stone would be much more appropriate if you're going to improve it for many people. And likewise, I think at the bottom of the footpaths on the main road, uh, rather than having a rather high style, awkward for the older generation, you should put in a kissing gate as part of the requirement, um, make it much more usable and more friendly. Uh, phosphate credits now. We are told that you are being, you are allocating phosphate credits to this site already, or is that for the future? Because it says you are relying upon the Shobden uh, wetland system for your phosphate credits. Well, I think there's already a very large backlog of um, perfectly sound applications which have been passed, uh, which should have um, priority in this particular case. Uh, I know certainly in my ward, there are a number of very sound applications that are relying upon these phosphate credits from this wetland. So what's going to happen to those? Uh, I hope that this one, as you might say, a Johnny come lately, doesn't get priority. It, it doesn't deserve to, I don't think. Uh, we should be looking after the the, the standing order, I would say. Uh, I think the size of the houses might be addressed, I think, and we should be thinking about what is more appropriate for our locality and the people who live in our locality. That seems to be not considered in this particular case, unfortunately. Uh, we do need perhaps smaller houses rather than a plethora of big houses. Um, the pumping station, uh, is there, is there a, a working pumping station? How closely monitored is it? Does it discharge into the brook on frequent occasions? And could we please have some comments on that, please? And the relationship between the church and the other houses, a lot of very fine list of buildings in this area. And you would have to say, you would have to require a very high standard of design and development. And I believe high quality design and development in, in your development is no more expensive than poor quality design. We've seen too many very poorly designed as, uh, developments recently, and it's very disappointing. We've got to demand the very highest uh, standards. Councillor Bowen, I think your time, you, you have your three minutes. Uh, do you want to talk about one or two points that have been raised? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Bowen. I will work through those in order. You'll have to um, maybe work if I miss anything. Um, your first point relates to the extent of the allocation um, and the settlement boundary. So the site, the application site forms the entirety of the allocated site as set out within the NDP. It's the only allocated site within Tarrington, although there is a settlement boundary, which was shown on the slide earlier, edged in black, which um, surrounds the, essentially the main part of, of the village. Um, but the application site itself is does form the entirety of, of the allocation within the NDP. So there'd be no, no expectation of further development in that area? In, in terms of the current development plan, then no. Thank you. Um, in, terms, in terms of public rights, where I know this, this came up as a point of discussion um, on, on the site visit yesterday. In terms of, again, the, the policy requirement for the allocated site within the NDP, it does expect that the public right of way will be improved. So whilst it doesn't set out how it envisages that coming forward, for the local highway authority to adopt that and therefore be able to maintain it as a list, of, so it becomes a list of streets um, and is, is maintained as such, um, I've had confirmation from the local highways authority that it would need to be tarmac. So I appreciate that is, that may find that somewhat disappointing in terms of our conversation yesterday. However, 
I think with a suitable landscape strategy and scheme that would come forward the reserve at a stage, then the impacts of that could be could be suitably mitigated. And similarly, I know there were concerns relating to tarmac um, with respect to drainage. It is um, 1.5 two meters wide, so it's not very wide. And again, the drainage strategy that would come forward would be expected also to demonstrate how the um, central impact of that would, would be addressed. So whether that be through loose weed tarmac, which is draining, it would be a suitable. Okay, yeah. So again, the details of that will, will, we can we can secure. We will be securing it in, in any case. Um, Link to that as well in terms of where the public footpath meets the A438, it wouldn't be a style, it would be a form of gate. And again, those the details of that would, would be agreed um, at a later date, but it would be an improvement to the style so that it is, um, it is accessible by all. <coughs> Moving on in terms of phosphate credits. So as, I, as I've set out, they've been offered an allocation of phosphate credits, which draws down on that that's come forward from the, the, the Luston wetland. The amount of credit is commensurate with the impact of, of the scheme and that's been calculated through the nutrient neutrality calculator. Um, but in order to allocate the way that they've been allocated in terms of the allocation, the list, this is I believe number seven on the list. So it, it, they are being offered on a on a case by case basis um, from, the, from the date in which they're validated at present. Um, Again, in terms of the size of the houses, um, this is this application is outlined. So we don't know how small or big those houses are going to be. But in terms of the the bedroom numbers and housing mix, there is a condition which ensures that any reserve matter application responds to the latest housing housing market pair and needs assessment. So whilst we haven't specified the number of two, three, or four bedroom houses, the condition is such that. At whatever stage that reserve matters application comes forward, it is expected to respond to the housing market needs at that time. Um, with respect to pumping stations, at this point in time, there is no pumping station proposed as part of the application. Whilst it's been referred to as a potential with respect to family water <coughs> in terms of making that the required mains connection. As advised within the consultation response from land drainage and the BLP, there is potential possibility for there to be a gravity fed solution. So that again are, are, are things that are details that will need to be addressed as part of uh, as part of the drainage strategy, which I think is at condition five. We require that to be submitted with any forthcoming reserve matters application. So it won't be a case that we get a reserve matter submission in say a year's time and then they're trying and then we have the applicant trying to discharge the drainage details in six years time after the reserve mass has been agreed it needs to be dealt with at the same time and that goes in, that goes the same in terms of any attenuation features and any other associated infrastructure which would require a maintenance regime to go with it so it will form part and parcel of a reserve matters application when considering the layout um, and then similarly with respect again to your comments on listed buildings as I, as I set out within the presentation and within the report, it will be for any reserve matters application to demonstrate that there would be no adverse impact on, on the setting of listed buildings and indeed the, the wider landscape. In, in terms of the site is allocated on the basis that it has capacity for six dwellings, taking account of the site's constraints. Um, but in terms of the details, then that will be a consideration of, um, for, for the reserve matters stage. Hoping that answers your questions. Th thank you, Mr. Jones. Councillor Mill. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I'm grateful to the case officer for this morning answering my the question I put to him at the site meeting yesterday about the agricultural <coughs> land classification. Uh, just to remind everybody, uh, grade one and grade two uh, land and soils recognised as best and most versatile by the National Planning and Policy Framework, recognised and protected, uh, um, paragraph 174, and indeed in our own uh, policy, in the core strategy policy SS7 on addressing climate change, where it quite clearly says development proposals will be required to protect the best agricultural land. So why have we got such a blind spot on this? It's a question I so frequently 
have to raise at planning committees uh, and is, does deserve greater consideration. After all, our best and most versatile agricultural land is no longer made. It's a finite resource and we need it. it we need it uh, for food production and we need it for combating climate change because this sort of land uh, has been shown to be the best at uh, <coughs> embodying carbon. Forgive my breathlessness, I'm uh, not very well at the moment. So I just ask members to consider this uh, when they come to vote. And the other, the other little point I would make in support of Councillor Bowen on the, uh, on the proposal to uh, use tarmac for uh, the, um, the footpath. Now, uh, why we can't use, if we are going to do this, a locally sourced as dug self-binding hog in, which uh, is durable, attractive, uh, and much more cost effective, I don't know. Uh, only, we would only have to consider using tarmac if this was a shared use path, if this was uh, required for cycles as well. But at 1.5 meters, it, it uh, do doesn't meet uh, LTN 120 standards. So um, that's the uh, local uh, traffic note on, on cycling, by the way. Uh, so uh, <coughs> there, is, there is no absolute requirement for it to be tarmac. And I do support Councillor Bowen on that. Thank you. That's as much as I can say. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Rund. I, I would add that uh, the classification of land is very questionable. Uh, as farmers know, many, many of the classifications of three are better, than, are better than two, and two are better than one, and vice versa. It was done in the wartime and done very ad hoc at the time. Um, now I'll move on to Councillor Norman. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for a very thorough report, very detailed indeed, so much appreciated. And also the visit, which I think was necessary and very enlightening, as they usually are, and really gave us a perspective on, on the site we're talking about. Um, it's, it, it, this site has been designated by the neighbourhood plan, so some form of development is likely to take place here. And um, I think the key, the important thing is the form of it, the design, the actual placing of the um, of buildings and so on, and particularly in relation to the visibility, the environment surrounding it, and the listed buildings, as we've heard and seen, there are a really remarkably large number in this particular area. So all that, I think, is to be, is, is a matter of concern. Um, the point has been made about future further development, question marks over that, what might happen, uh, we don't know, but I, I hope we're being assured that it's unlikely and that this particular development, particularly reduced from, I think, 15 houses in the first instance, is what's considered appropriate. Very quick reference to uh, Councillor Milne's point about soil. We, we do seem to forget it all the time and the, the importance of our <coughs> agricultural land. And although we can't do anything much about this particular instance, uh, it is something which the council should be noting and referencing in its development of the local plan, which is in progress at the moment. So I hope we can take that one on board and you know, it, 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 it is incredibly important and relevant. Um, so uh, the detail will come back to us, uh, hopefully to committee, as, as a local member has requested, and that does seem amazingly important, the quality of the housing, the design and all the rest of it, and the size, what is needed, that's what we need to uh, be uh, aware of. Quick agreement over the footpath, I hate the idea of tarmac across a rural field, it seems awful, and I really can't see why it's necessary. Decent, well bedded, embedded hogging, or whatever the term is, would be absolutely fine, I would have thought. Glad to hear there's going to be a gate. This is not just for older people, this is younger people with families, children, and so on. It's work we're doing all over the place in trying to improve that sort of access, particularly in my local area. Um, uh, quick mention, too, of the ecologists comments, the environment officer, um, management of the uh, 
of, of any planting and maintenance and protection of trees that are already there, including root protection. I think she makes reference or he makes reference to that, often forgotten during the development. Root protection is so important because that can be massively damaging to trees. Um, quick further one on the um, uh, on the crop on, on the footpath. Did I pick up that there is a crossing um, uh, that will be provided? Because it's all very well getting people to the main road, but if you're going to expect them to use buses and things of that sort, uh, there also needs to be a safe way across the road. Um, is that part of the picture? I, it's probably in there somewhere, but it's so detailed, I'm afraid I haven't discovered it. You know, afraid of time. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Do you want to? Yeah. So you want to? <laughs> thank, thank you, Councillor. Well. Yeah, so in terms of the, again, off site highways improvements, it would, it would include um, an unsignalised crossing, which essentially is, is just a drop curve, but it would at least a mark where that, that point of crossing but would be. Not a painted road. I mean, there wouldn't be crossing marks. No, really, so no. There needs to be that, really to have it safe and, you know, properly accessible. Okay, Councillor Rowe. Thank you very much. Uh, great village, it's got a pub. I love new pubs, as everybody here knows. <laughs> Wonderful bus service, Hereford, Ledbury. Uh, for me though, uh, and you know, when Councillor Milne speaks, you, you, the last four years have told us, you've got to listen. And he's quite right when he says, we, we're not making grade one and grade two land anymore. There are so many brownfield sites and greyfield sites, not necessarily in this village, obviously, uh, but we should be looking to build on there first. However, the Tarrington Neighbourhood Development Plan, TAR 8, says it all really. This is the single solitary site that the good people of Tarrington have appointed to be developed. So who are we to say no? I'm very pleased though that TAR T A R seven uh, down to housing size type and tenure really important as picked up and emphasised and requested by the local member Councillor Hardwick uh, at a later stage this application should come back to the committee to consider the tenure. Um, in your report, Mr. Jones, it's that the with regard to the the gated access at the back of the redundant bus stop and I think a couple of colleagues have picked up on it as well a pedestrian gate it is going to be a pedestrian gate and not a vehicular gate isn't it it's not going to be for a, a, or, or some sort of extension so that a tractor can get into the field as well no that's okay then um I think that would do me actually but uh, I'm afraid I'm going to be voting with recommendation because th there is there is no other choice on this matter. Councillor Shaw. Uh, thank you Chair um, and I'd just like to report <coughs> on some of my colleagues uh, comments um, but also to understand in terms of the outline application um, what what uh, conditioning we as a committee can place on it. Um, in terms of the um, public right of way surface can we condition that it's not in and it is adopted or is that outside our powers um, in terms of um, the site itself i'd like to understand the uh, site as i understand it is the site within the mdp and what weighting we have to give to that site in the ndp and how we balance that against the agricultural value of the land um, and if I can read my writing, I scribbled earlier on. Um, yes, and um, just how we can reflect on the, the better housing needs analysis um, suggestions. Um, is it a possibility for this committee at this stage to condition sizes of houses on this site? So um, some legal questions, I suppose. Mr. Jones, sorry. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, in, in terms of the surfacing, I, again, I, I clarified this with, with the local highway, highway authority yesterday, and it, it has previously been agreed that for the improvements to come forward in terms of the upgrading of the public right of way as required by the policy, then it, it would need to be a tarmac surface. I mean, that's not 
you know, the, we're not, it's, that's not set out within the condition or the sort of approved plans, but it would, in terms of those details coming forward, in terms of through the section 278 agreement, it would need to be tarmac, to my understanding, for it to be adopted and therefore in terms of the wider package of improvements coming forward um, for the local highway authority to be able to adopt that. Um, and that, that's what we that's what I've been advised as the officer in terms of from the from the local highways authority. Um, in, in terms of the NDP and, and the, the allocation and the its interface with the sort of balance in terms of agricultural land classification, the NDP is adopted, it forms part of the development plan and it sits alongside the core strategy. So the allocation of this site, in essence, infers that the site, from a locational perspective, is acceptable for housing. Um, so whilst members you know, can consider the loss of greater agricultural land, the fact that it is an allocated site within the neighbour development plan infers that from a locational perspective, residential development here is, is acceptable. Um, turning to the final Point relating to the housing mix. Um, I think it's condition 15, um, which essentially sets, sets out that any reserve matters application will respond in a positive manner to the latest housing market area needs assessment. I think we probably, you know, the advice I think obviously gives, we probably look to avoid actually stipulating a prescribed mix at this stage because obviously, whilst the housing market area needs assessments are probably unlikely to change in the next two or three years in terms of the time frame that we're talking about. There is obviously the possibility that that does happen. So there may be the potential that when any reserve matters application does come in, the mix we prescribed today isn't actually what's needed at that point in time. So the condition as worded is, ensures that whatever comes forward responds to the latest housing market area needs assessment. I hope that answers your questions. Councillor Watson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ollie. Um, yeah, um, a really good report. And, um, um, I think it's such a failing that in a rural county, we actually don't look at agri-hoods, where we look at growing food and having housing in the same space. So within the NDP, there are opportunities for the future to look at agri-hoods, and I would really welcome it within a rural county to look at how we are going to have future food resilience because like my colleagues um, it's and being a farmer's daughter i just i'm always really disappointed to see houses built on very good soil and i understand what you're saying chair about um, grading but um my issue is around and it's a silly question probably is that why hasn't an amended updated landscape plan been submitted when two officers requested it like from the historic officer um the building conservation and the landscape officer because uh, the landscape officer couldn't endorse the current landscape plan um because it's there's no clarification what's going to happen to the northern end of the plot um you know they're all cited at the bot you know the southeastern end but um, for me, it's about, you know, as um, I think the building conservation officer noted, it's about having an orchard or something about, you know, blending. As um, Josh Bailey, the YVA AUMB planning officer said, screening should be no, um, not used as, a, you know, um, as a screen. But I think to look at other issues, and this is where I'm still new at planning, is around uh, reserve matters in terms of stating what kind of building materials the houses will be made out of to blend into the landscape, and um, if that could be noted as well. But um, yeah, I can see that the chair wants to say something. Well, it's just a matter of that that's at the next stage. Yeah. Uh, and you know, uh, we mustn't preempt what. Okay. We've come in with the application, the detailed planning okay. application. And the other thing <coughs> is that we as a committee can't actually say that the reserved matters stage has to come to, we can't make that recommendation or for the next administration. So it's outline planning, planning just entirely mm. and the details, we, you know, we're wasting our time getting into details. Okay, the we last can, thing is We can use it as a wish to, what we would like to happen. Yeah. That will be for the. Yeah. For the uh, 
For me, it's like, about the tarmac as well, Chair. I, I, I agree I, with I, you. I think that in my ward, boats, byways open to all traffic. We can't even get our boats tarmac resurfaced, to, which is servicing 20 houses. And if my residents are hearing that we're going to tarmac a footpath to be adopted, it's I just I just think it sends out the wrong message because it's a rural, you know, it's a rural track. Um, I, I just can't believe what the officers are recommending. Um, and it's speechless for someone who sits on the Wide Valley A U M B. Well, we might as well just concrete the whole of Herefordshire, might we, and tarmac it. It's um it's it, it's a really bad precedent. Don't Sorry. get me on the boats because I've I've got yes. I've got bruises related to boats. Yeah. <laughs> rough seas, rough seas. Yeah, I mean I, I think there are some of the, potentially some of the, the jewels in our in our county that have been desecrated by mm. Councillor Andrews. Yeah, just just a question on the section two seven eight agreement, and it comes to highways. Does the path have to come into that agreement? Can we take that out? Can we just do the pathway on the road? The updating for that to go to the bus bus shelter and the other bit to be taken out? Does it all have to be combined as one? Mr. Jones. Yes. I think essentially that, that could be taken out, but I think the issue then is obviously there needs to be some form of management of that public right of way um, so that it can be maintained in perpetuity. And at, at the moment, to my mind, we haven't, we haven't got that. And in terms of actually the improve, in terms of the improvements that are required in terms of the allocated site as a whole, we, we've, we've got that at the moment in terms of it all being adopted and being part and parcel of those improvements. If I get this sharply down if I'm wrong, if it's and if it's adopted, obviously it has to be to highway standards. If it's unadopted and it's still in the it would still be in the ownership of the landowner, am I correct in saying that? It'd be up to him to maintain the path like anybody else. So if we take that part out of it, it'd be in that ownership of the landowner, am I correct in saying that? And then it wouldn't be adopted. That's what I'm trying to say. We don't adopt it as, a, as the council. I think the issue that we've got at the moment is that the proposal, as it stands, includes the surfacing of the footpath, and the applicant would foot that bill, subject to compliance with the Section 278 agreement. If you decide to take that out of the equation, then that causes complexities in terms about how that footpath improvement is delivered. It's a, it's a specific requirement of TAR 8 that the footpath is improved in order to provide pedestrian connectivity. So there is a trade-off, there's no doubt about that. Um, and if, if, if the improvement um, requires um, it to be tarmacked, in order that the council maintains it, which is essentially what we're saying, then that's the trade-off you have to consider. Otherwise, you run the risk of a scheme that doesn't deliver that pedestrian improvement. Thank you, Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Andrews B. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, Given that the land is allocated for how, part of housing as part of the Tarrington uh, plan, we can't say no to that. But like everybody else, I'm appalled at the idea that this fairly lengthy footpath is going to be tarmacked 1.5 meters, 1.25 meters wide, if I've got the figures right. That's quite wide to have this stretch of tarmac stretch going down past fields. Um, there surely is a way that the highways people can accept something <coughs> less ugly than tarmac. And oh, could I also comment, you say um, this will enable it to be maintained. We've got dozens of footpaths are, uh, in this country, in this county, the public rights of way that are not maintained. So I can't believe that it's necessary for tarmac to this, for this one either. Perhaps we, we might get some legal 
opinion on this, but I just suggest that in order to further do this, Sorry, that, that um, left be open you. to negotiation with the application. Applicant, I mean, sorry, <clears throat> to provide something more suitable, I don't know, but then you see the powers that be, highways, say that it has to be targeted. So we're in a catch-22 situation, so. Okay. Yeah, we'll see what Chairman, I'm reminded of the councillor we used to have, which is to say to the officers, we, what we want to go away and find a way of doing it. I'm sure there's a way somewhere we can preserve us this footpath without putting can we miles have of tarmac down. Katie's opinion from highways, please. Hi, thank you. Um, in terms of the footpath, um, the Highway high Authority can only adopt um, a tarmac surface. It can't adopt a hogging surface. It's not to say you can't have a hogging surface, but it just means that we won't maintain it and it will be down to the landowner to maintain it, which, you know, it's fine for the initial few years, but in five, ten years, will that path still be usable by all, all users, for example, somebody with a with a wheelchair or um, a, a pushchair? Um, so that that's the trade-off. If if it needs, if we want, we we're going to maintain it, then it needs to be a tarmac surface. Um, but if if the landowner is happy to maintain it, then um, we won't adopt it. But equally, it'd be down to the landowner to maintain it, which over over time may deteriorate. Uh, I, I I do ask that important that disability access is so vitally important to know. Councillor Boyd, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, most parish councils have a, a footpath officer and have some provision for maintaining their footpaths. Surely this would come into that um, organisation, wouldn't it? Yes. I mean, certainly in all my in my ward, all my parish councils have a footpath officer, and they are very assiduous in doing their very best, sometimes with the help of the, the county steward, to maintain their footpaths and make them possible and easy to use. Mr. Baxter, sorry. Without time making them, by the way. Thank you, Chairman. And I think this, we're getting a bit sort of waylaid with the whole issue of, as far as the footpath is concerned. The point is, is yes, we are talking about the route of a designated public footpath. But the point here is, is that you're providing a specific means of access and improvement between the site specifically and school lane and the bus stop. So. In the usual sense, whilst we all use public footpaths if we're taking our dogs for a walk or, or going for a walk in the countryside, you expect it to be a muddy footpath. In this instance, we're specifically talking about an improvement to provide accessibility. So not necessarily people going out for a walk in the countryside. We're talking about people having a means of access to a bus stop. So the expectation isn't that they're going to walk along a muddy footpath, it's that it's going to be a surface of some sort. So I think that's we sort of, you know, clearly all of the public footpaths in the county, there's no expectation that they'll all be surfaced because we wouldn't enjoy them in the usual sense that we do. But in this instance, we're talking about a specific improvement in order to improve pedestrian connectivity between an application site and uh, the public bus service. Um, as Katie has said, um, it's down to the adoption of that, that footpath. If members decide that the tarmac surface isn't appropriate, then we are placing the onus on the landowner, the applicant, um, and potentially a footpath uh, officer and the parish council to maintain that in the future. The parish council are happy to maintain it in the future, then perhaps the option of a, a hogging surface is a realistic one, but you run the risk that, as Katie has said, over time the footpath is deteriorated and it doesn't serve the purpose that policy TAR8 intends, or indeed I think as uh, members of a planning committee that we would intend. Thank you, Chair. Just very quickly, I, I, um, tarmac is not the only decent surface, it's, that's the point. Um, we, we're not, they're not exclusive. It does not have to be either mud or tarmac. There's perfectly good 
um, hard surfaces that can be provided. I, I mean, we're going on about this because this is about visibility. We're, we're really concerned that we don't, you know, mess up this rather lovely area, that we find the best possible way forward, um, visually as well as practically. And it is possible. It may not be part of our, you know, what we do, but I think we need to find a way to do this without dumping tarmac, horrible, poisonous, toxic stuff across a rather lovely route. So I, I really ask that whatever we decide in terms of permission, we, in all genuine good intention, find a better way to provide that service. Right. Thank you, Jane. I don't disagree with Councillor Norman. I think the point is simply is from the council's perspective as the local highway authority, if it's not tarmacked, it won't be adopted. That's the bottom line. So negotiate with the landowner. Councillor Watson, quickly. Yeah, I was just going to um, support uh, Councillor Norman because going on to the sensorytrust.org.uk about all the different types of agrids that can be used safely for mobility um, are listed um, on there. So um, I just think that, again, I just think, I think it just sets a really dangerous precedent. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, can, can, I, can I just use my discretion to allow the local member to speak, um, bearing in mind a particular issue on this particular issue? Right, thank you, Chairman. Um, I know it's unusual for the ward council to come in at this point, but uh, I just ask officers a question. Would it be possible to um, uh, condition a management agreement um, on, on the, um, the estate as, as such to actually maintain a proposed footpath improvement? Because we, we've got um, we've got unadopted roads in Carrington Church um, Church Lane, I believe it is uh, called locally. Uh, that's currently not adopted by the council. Desperately needs uh, work done on it. Uh, the council can't afford to do it, and it's way way down the peck in order of, of uh, when it might be adopted, um, and then. There's us discussing a footpath being adopted by the highways. That, yeah. in all probability, the highways, you know, the budget won't be there for highways to maintain it. So, a management agreement, I would have thought, imposed on on the planning permission would be the answer to this. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Jones and I have just had a quick exchange of words. Yes, we do think that we could possibly do that. We um, impose conditions uh, in a slightly different sense, but requiring landscape management plans to be agreed um, with developers and landowners. Um, I don't necessarily see that as a huge difference in this respect. So um, on that basis, yes, I think we probably could impose a condition to that. As we haven't as yet had a, a formal uh, um, proposal. Uh, can someone propose, bearing in mind that amendment to the proposal, that a man management agreement be agreed to? Are you happy to move yeah. that? And yeah. Is that seconded? Yeah. Councillor Andrews down there. And could we also all, also add that the area to the north is conclusive within, you know, what the use is going to be for the northern area within the landscape plan. Because that. that's two officers are asking for, um, you know, for clarification. <coughs> if we are having a management, you know, a landscape plan, can we have it very clear about what that area is going to be used Mr. for? Mr. The areas to the north isn't part of the application site. As such, it's not part of your red line application. So, the speculation about what it might be used for in the future. Somebody might make a an application to build houses of it on it in five years' time. We'll have to consider that on its merits at the time that we receive a planning application. But you can impose conditions on the red line application sites, but not on that area. We've had a proposal uh, by Councillor Rowan and seconded by Councillor Andrews. Uh, 
Before I come to the local member, do you wish to say anything further? <coughs> Mr. Jones or Mr. Banks? Um, only in respect um, of, of the, the proposal that's been made by Councillor Roan, um, we need to amend Condition 7 because clearly that refers specifically to the public rights of way improvements. So your recommendation would also include some amendments to Condition 7 as well. Okay. Councillor Hardwick. Well, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, members, for a very thorough debate. Um, I don't wish to prolong this uh, too, too long, but um, I think with um, a management agreement as proposed, um, I, th I think that would improve the situation and uh, appease members' concerns with regards to uh, our footpath. So um, I look forward to the vote. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Well, we have a proposal and a seconder. We have a motion before us. Those in favour, please show. Those against? One. No abstentions? Seven. None. But that is carried. I'll now have a quick, well, I'd like it to be five minutes, but um, break, but it may be ten minutes if we can for a couple of breaks. <laughs> in person for the agenda item seven, join the meeting. Mr. Chat Chatwin, Eaton Bishop Paris Council. Ms. Wall, local objector. And Mr. Priest, the applicant's agent, please take their seats at the public participation tables. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the meeting. We'll, I will call you to speak following the officer's pre presentation of the, on the application. The application before us concerns land south of Utree Farm, Rutnell Common Ro Road, Eaton Bishop, Hereford. Reserve matters following outline, uh, outline approval, uh, outline for three or four bedroom dwelling on a plot land currently held off Hillcrest Garden. Mr. Rolls will make the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I just check people can hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this application seeks reserves matters approval for a four bed, two storey dwelling, encompassing matters of access, layout, scale, appearance, and landscaping. Outline permission was granted on the 3rd of September 2019. Uh, the application relates to a site lying within the rural settlement of Ruckle. Uh, the site location is indicated by the red star on the plan on the screen. Uh, the application is reported to the Planning Committee following a redirection request from the local ward member. Uh, as regards updates, I should direct members to a correction to paragraph 6.24 of the officer report following advice received from the Council's private water team. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so the site area is edged in red, uh, with access being taken from the existing field gate entrance off Ruffle Common Road. The aerial photograph at the bottom of the slide shows the, the burden nature of the existing site and uh, the semi, uh, sorry, the wider semi-rural village context. Uh, the sloping nature of the site will also be evident to members from the photographs to be displayed at the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so these, this is the existing site plan, uh, which reflects the presence of a public footpath to the northwestern boundary and the presence of the closest neighbouring property at New Tree Farm, including a collection of steel framed, corrugated clad buildings near to the boundary of the site. The proposed site plan uh, indicates the siting of a dwelling broad, broadly centrally within this narrow plot, with a long driveway finding its way up the slope to a modest parking and turning area. The dwelling would be of a bespoke design, it's broadly T-shaped in plan form, and it has been reduced in size as part of this application process. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide uh, shows the proposed landscaping, uh, which reflects retention of trees along the site boundaries, and proportionate planting to, to enhance character. Some ecological enhancement measures are also shown, 
will be there is a related condition on the outline permission that will need to be discharged separately. Uh, the new driveway will be, will be a permeable construction, construction acting as an engineered soak away for surface water. Uh, the access visibility and gradient are also shown, which are pursuant to conditions attached to the outline permission. And finally, I'd draw your attention to paragraph 6.6 .6 of the officer report as regards local <coughs> concerns about the visibility to the southeast of that access point. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this slide shows the proposed house design and scale, uh, including a mixture of uh, brickwork and render under an artificial slate roof. Um, it's worthy of pointing out that the ridge height of the dwelling has been significantly reduced as part of the application due to the need to relocate the dwelling further uphill. This was a consequence of the need to secure gravity fed drainage solutions. Um, in terms of the overall recommendation, it's, its appearance and scale considered to be acceptable. Next slide, please. Okay, so collectively, the next two slides show the, the proposed drainage arrangements and the proposed levels. Uh, the drainage proposals include the use of drainage mains to attend to treated water discharged from the new package treatment plant. And also, it shows the, the use of shallow soakways that are mentioned within the driveway area. I direct you to paragraph 6.22 to 6.24 of the officer report in this respect. Um, we move to the next slide, the levels. It can be seen from this slide that the house finished floor level would sit at 87.187 metres AOD, which is roughly five metres above the adjacent road level at the entrance. It's acknowledged that this would sit up relative to nearby houses, uh, but it's still uh, accepted, acceptably accommodated within its built and natural setting. Next slide, please. Okay, so finally, these are the photographs that I promised earlier, uh, taken when the leaves were in trees were in leaf, rather. Um, the top left is looking up the site from the road, uh, the top right is looking downhill towards the road. Bottom left is looking from a, a roadside gateway serving the public lying to the south of the site. Uh, so looking across essentially. And the bottom right is looking at the proposed access point on the adjacent entrance to Utree Farm. Uh, so just to conclude, the officer recommendation is for approval subject to conditions. The reserve matters details that are subject to the application and the consideration have all been found to be acceptable. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Now I can invite uh, speakers. Can I now invite Mr. Chatwin on behalf of Eton Bishop Parish Council to speak? You have three minutes. Good morning, committee, and thank you, Chair, for inviting us to speak. Uh, development of the site in question is supported by the Parish Council, but subject to appropriate measures being put in place. The site is identified in the Eton Bishop N NDP, and the NDP goes on to identify flooding as a particular concern to be addressed in Rockall with paragraph 2.33 on drainage stating, and I quote, expert advice was obtained which guided the parish council to limit further development in Ruckwell and ensure identified sites are designed to ensure satisfactory surface and foul water drainage provisions, end quote. Furthermore, and importantly, policy EB7 of the NDP on managing flood risk specifically states that, quote, opportunities will be sought to reduce the overall level of flood risk and the proposals must demonstrate they are safe and will not increase flood risk to third parties, with flood risk <coughs> provided where possible. You will have seen from previous representations that this is a key concern for us, as we've not received the reassurance we're seeking. Planning officers visited the site on the 22nd of March 2023 in the presence of members of the Parish Council on a dry day following rain, and were able to see that this plot is the only one on the road which water flows onto the road. In the past, in heavy rain, water has flooded across the road down the driveway opposite and opposite and affected houses there. Um, this happened most recently in December 2021. The provisions were put in the NDP specifically because of flooding risks in Ruckle, presenting challenges to, challenges to neighbouring houses, but also posing potential phosphate pollution draining into the heavily challenged River Wye, which is less than 200 metres from Ruckle. The addition of foul water drainage to existing surface water drainage will obviously increase the volume of water potential to flow onto and across the road. The drainage engineer states that a drainage, quote, a 
drainage channel will be constructed where the driveway meets the highway to prevent any overland surface water flows entering the highway. The surface water will be directed into an existing soakway area. End quote. It's not clear how this can function, as at the point where the proposed driveway will meet the road, there is a culvert which prevents the construction of the drainage channel. Furthermore, any soakway would be uphill of the proposed drainage channel. Finally, the drainage field is not, quote, 50 metres from the abstraction, any abstraction point of any groundwater supply, unquote, uh, as required in the drainage engineer's response to the outline planning provision dated 26 of July 2019. Uh, you will appreciate we are not yet convinced that these plans and local rent residents remain in a high state of anxiety about the proposal. In summary, we believe the proposal does not comply with paragraphs 2.33 of policy EB7 of the English of Neighbourhood Development Plan or the requirements of the drainage engineer's response to the outline planning permission and as such permission should not be granted until measures are put in place to comply. Thank you. I now um, ask Ms Wall, a local resident, to speak in objection to the plan. Thank you Mr Chairman and members of the committee. From outline planning to the last one for reserved matters that you are discussing today, there has been 37 representations from the local residents in the parish council, which I'm sure you are all aware of and have read. There are nine properties within the immediate locality that are affected, and of which residents from seven of those properties have made numerous representations about the drainage and access, which is causing them all much anxiety. Some of which have lived there many years and are feeling that if this should go ahead and we have problems, it may have to cause them to move. I thank those of the committee which visited the site yesterday, and I'm sure you will agree that parking is difficult in Ruckle. The hamlet of Ruckle has common throughout and is both sides of the highway, not as shown in 4.4 of the officer's report, as the Commons Register at the Council Department is actually incorrect. Many of you parked and drove on the common verges, one in a private driveway of a holiday let and one in the lane to Yew Tree Farm. This example shows how little room there is for construction traffic, especially if it cannot enter the plot. The outline planning for this plot had conditions from the highways, which read the access gate must be five metres wide. The opening boundary to boundary between the landowners on either side is only 4.3 metres. It also has a condition that the splays for access must be 20 metres either side, certainly not possible on the one side where the hedge is owned by a neighbour. With the access being so narrow, construction traffic will have problems entering and, exist and exiting this site without damaging ancient ditch, adjacent ditches, common land and driveway. With basic calculations, as the drawings that were submitted were not to scale, we worked out how much soil would need to be removed off the site and replaced with stone and materials to the site for the drainage and groundworks alone. If moved by an eight-wheel lorry of which the entrance would not be wide enough at present, this would take 50 lorry loads to just accomplish that. On a neighbouring plot, the developer actually opened the boundary 20 metres to be able to get a loaded and unloaded lorry whilst on site. This is not possible with the site we're discussing today. Having witnessed the tanker which came to the plot in the discussion we're using today to provide water for percolation tests, the largest they could use to enter that plot was what would be classed a seven and a half tonne four wheel lorry which would carry three and a half tonne at the most. If you use the same calculation as we have before for removal of soil and delivery of stone, this would take 280 lorry visits. This would be before any materials are brought on site to build the property or any retaining walls. The day-to-day -day impact on the residents and the surrounding countryside whilst construction is taking place would be devastating and we believe dangerous. There are also three registered businesses past this plot, which need clear access to the right to the Thank you. Right. I now invite Mr. Priest, the applicant's agent, to speak in support of the application. You have three minutes. To inform the design approach, we undertook a detailed evaluation of the site constraints, pattern of development, and local vernacular. Interestingly, this revealed that there was a house on the site until the early 20th century. The house has narrow proportions that reflect the shape of the site, and the front elevation addresses the highway. The house is, however, set back within the site, such that it will be considerably less prominent from the highway than most existing properties, and it benefits from mature screening that 
is to be retained. Through various amendments, the scale of the house has been reduced in terms of footprint and floor area. <coughs> Additionally, and in response to local concerns, the height has also been reduced by 1.4 metres, 4.5 feet. It is now a height akin to a one and a half storey cottage or dormer bungalow. Furthermore, the house is to be cut into the rising ground levels by setting the floor slab as low as possible to ensure the house does not reach the skyline. In terms of spoil management, the site is of a significant length and there is ample space within the site to uh, um, re-engineer the spoil so that the, it minimises off-site disposal, for example, behind the, the proposed dwelling. The design also focuses on minimising the carbon impact. The form is a simple rectangular shape which will aid in achieving a super-insulated airtight structure that minimises heat loss. This will be complemented by a low-carbon heating system, solar PVs, electric vehicle charging points and rainwater harvesting. I was a confirmed no objection to the safety of the access, including the visibility. In fact, when the splay line is taken to the centre of the highway, as national guidance permits, the visibility requirements are exceeded. We are happy to submit a construction traffic management plan to ensure any disruption during construction is minimised. This is covered by condition three of the officer report. Drainage is a planning condition item rather than a specific reserve matter for consideration under this application. Nevertheless, in response to concerns raised, we have fully considered drainage at this stage. This has included a thorough analysis of the existing site drainage conditions, including shallow and deep site investigations and circuit testing across all parts of the site. The proposed drainage solution is fully compliant with latest building regs and council drainage policy. Following a lengthy pro process working with the council lead drainage consultant, we are delighted that they agree and raise no objection. To put this into context, I regularly submit applications to around 15 councils across the region and beyond, and Hereford Council drainage team are the most rigorous of all that I deal with. They do, do not offer support lightly. In summary, the site is a housing allocation in the adopted NDP, and it benefits, benefits from outline planning for a detached four bed dwelling. <coughs> Importantly, there are no, there are also no technical based objections from council consultees. We are confident that this bespoke and sympathetically designed house will successfully integrate with the built and landscape context and embraces the design expectations of adopted NDP and other policies. Thank you. Right, Councillor Hitchner is the local ward member for this item. Sorry. Oh, if you could please take your seats in the gallery. <laughs> Councillor Hitchener is the local member for this particular uh, item um, and he, he speaks at the beginning and has the right to speak at the end of the debate. He does not have a vote, he has 10 minutes. Uh, thank you Chair and thank you uh, councillors for visiting the site uh, on, a, on a lovely uh, sunny morning. You experience what it's like in Rackle, uh, a quiet little uh, outlet quite close to the River Wye. Um, and I always thought it was interesting in the context of the conversation which you had with the previous application with the discussion of the reserve matters to come at a future time. And this in a way is the opportunity for, mem uh, for the local residents and for myself to make representations uh, on, on the reserve matters. Uh, the original application left two significant matters uh, to be considered, uh, significant so far as the local residents are concerned. Um, there have been 10 uh, objections from a very small community, uh, hence the reason why uh, this has come to this committee. The first objection relates to drainage from the site uh, and especially surface water, and the second relates to access. So if I can first deal with the first. So the site is wet. Uh, in periods of heavy rain, water runs off the site in the eastern corner and onto the highway. I personally witnessed that. It's not just a trickle, it's a significant amount of water. In this case, I think this is really important. If I can draw your attention, first of all, to uh, page 79 um, of the pack. At the very bottom, it uh, says, uh, it must also be ensured that surface water runoff generated by the proposed development does not get into the adjacent highway. Now, that happens at the moment. Um, so is, if there is a degree of improvement. Um, uh, but uh, actually, to, to this is a, this is a report from the drainage engineer who we, we, we all know well and love, um, and he is obviously concerned about uh, this particular aspect, and so draws attention to this. 
So then uh, over the page on page 80, halfway down, it says a drainage channel will be constructed where the driveway meets the highway to prevent any overland surface water flows into the highway. The surface water will be directed to an existing circleway area. So we have uh, a solution provided by the drainage engineer and we then have a look at the drawings and we find in the drawings there is no reference whatsoever to a drainage channel. There is no reference <coughs> to uh, a circleway. So although the, the, the draft planning conditions state that the development shall be carried out strictly in accordance with the approved plans, if that is the case, there is no drainage channel and there is no circleway. Now, I've had a past experience of drawings not really being quite up to uh, the, the, the way they should be. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the applicant may well decide, well, the, you know, the plan which is approved at this meeting is fine. That's what I'm going to do. And I would ask you as a, as, as a committee to consider whether that's appropriate. I can see this being a problem down the line. And I would like the drawing to be amended to show the tra channel and to show where this uh, the uh, circleway is to be located. And I, I, if, if that requires a postponement uh, or an adjournment, um, uh, well, postponement to another meeting, then, then, then so be it. But I think this is a really important, it's obviously very important to the engineer. He specifically mentioned it, water not going onto the highway, water going down this drainage ditch, which is not shown on the drawings. So that's the first, first point. The second, um, Oh, yeah, and I, I'd add to this actually, going back again to the papers, you'll find on a, page 83, under 5.2, it refers to the church commissioners. And there, halfway through the paragraph, it says a drainage channel is illustrated on the drawings, but no indication as to, the, to, as to its connection is given. At present, this could significantly increase the amount of water entering the ditch network on the commissioner's property or flowing over the lake. So we have the local residents concerned, we have the church commissioners concerned, uh, and we have the dra drainage engineer concerned all about this. It's a significant element, I think. Uh, and of course, the drainage channel is it, probably going to actually be on the church commissioner's land. And as far as I know, no approach has been made to the church commissioners to obtain their approval uh, to, to this particular uh, development. So, uh, <coughs> I then move on. So the second concern relates to access, particularly during the building of the, of, of the plot. Condition 10 of the, original, the outline planning permission requires the council to approve parking for site operatives. Uh, you've seen the lack of parking, what a significant issue that is going to be, uh, and access as those lorries go down that road uh, and turn into the, into the entrance way. Uh, it's, it's going to be a really difficult problem, not only actually physically doing it, but a disturbance to the neighbours. We all know um, of developments where mud gets onto the road uh, and we have to ask the enforcement officer to go in and, and, and get uh, uh, the road properly cleared up. Um, and it all, all takes time. Uh, it's inconvenient for the uh, local residents uh, and it's just a physical uh, problem. Um, it is uh, perhaps in for, unfortunate in my view that outline permission was granted uh, to Councillor Hardwick at the previous application referred to his, his preference would have been for a full application not an outline one and I think this is another example where that should actually have been done it, it actually would have helped enormously for the the new uh, owner of this land uh, because the land has been sold with outline planning and all these problems have unfortunately passed to the new owner it's not their, it's their fault that things are, are, are not suitable. Uh, and I don't think it's for this planning committee to, to cover off any of the difficulties. Um, it was, it was the, it, it, it's gone to a new owner and I'm, I'm, I have sympathy for their issues. Um, an, an issue has been raised as the amendment uh, that's come forward from uh, uh, the officer is, is uh, about the water uh, um, being drawn from uh, um, a couple of local wells. Uh, it appears that uh, an environment agency permit is required uh, for that. Um, the officer's reply, I think, mentions that it's not a planning matter. It's a matter for the environment agency. Uh, it's a matter then, presumably, of whether the applicant is going to apply uh, appropriately for um, for the environment agency uh, permit. And I would hope that he will be able to do that. 
Um, I think, um, Chairman, I think that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, local member. Oh, I invite debate. Councillor Stone. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I think as we've seen in the um, presentations, drainage has been raised as a matter of significant local concern, as is said in uh, point 6.4. And um, this has very much uh, been highlighted by the speakers and also by the local member. Um, and it's a matter that concerns many of us also in, in other villages um, in our wards uh, when there are drainage issues. There seem to be so many loose ends in this application of drainage that the parish council has highlighted the problem um, and they have the local knowledge that most of us don't have. And um, they know what it's like when there's heavy rain and it comes onto the highway and causes all sorts of problems for the residents there. Um, as the local members said, there's no drainage channel or soak away. And um, I'd also like to know about this retaining wall that's mentioned on page 87. The other point is, Chairman, that um, we're getting much heavier rain now. Um, various storms we've had in March, in the last few weeks, um, it's been just one storm after another. It's not just the normal April showers. Uh, the climate's <coughs> changing, as we all know. We don't need to be told that. But what we do know is it's leading to heavier downpours. And that, that causes all sorts of problems, certainly in, in villages, with water pouring out of inadequate drainage. This planning application is an opportunity to address some of these issues. I don't feel the reports address them sufficiently, and I shall find it very difficult to support this application until we get a lot more reassurance on the drainage issues. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bowie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm concerned about the legalities involved here. This place, this site, already has outlined planning permission, I believe. It's correct, isn't it? Yeah. So if we vote against this, what are we doing? Are we um, having to go back to square one? Uh, do we have to then face legal costs if there's an appeal against this? Uh, it just, I think we need some reassurance as to what, what happens if we do vote against it. And I know there's a lot of significant problems here that it, I think most of us don't feel have been properly addressed, including the drainage issue and the and the water on the road issue, uh, which are both I think, quite serious. And certainly uh, in winter time with flooding and freezing, you have a huge opportunity for heavy risk to, to road traffic, let alone anything else. Uh, the site is also extraordinarily narrow and construction vehicles uh, would find it very difficult getting up and down there, I think, as they build in a road themselves. Um, in wet conditions, even a four-wheeler is going to have trouble getting up there. You might have to dump at the gateway and uh, then put it, put it all on, on a dumper truck and take it up the top, as far as materials go. Uh, I think it's, there's so many, shall we say, uncertainties in this particular plan and so little reassurance as to how it's going to be managed, that I find it quite hard to uh, endorse it at the moment. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Chairman. I just want to pick up on one particular point um, sooner rather than later, and that's with regards to <laughs> drainage matters. <laughs> I want to draw your attention um, to paragraph 6.22 of the officer's report. Um, and highlight the fact that there is a condition on the outline planning permission that requires further details of surface and foul water drainage arrangements to be submitted. That condition is still relevant. The, the, this submission isn't seeking to discharge condition 12. So you can be reassured in your deliberations that whilst the precise details aren't provided by this reserve matters application, there is still an outline, an outline permission and a condition that bites as far as drainage is concerned. So those details will need to be submitted to the local planning authority for their approval before work commences on the site. That said, you've got um, a technical consultee response and backwards and forwards to a land drainage engineer um, on several occasions. You've heard the applicant's agent say how rigorous our land drainage engineer is by comparison to other local planning authorities. Um, and 
I think you know that's as a consequence of the difficult drainage conditions that we have in parts of Herefordshire. So, and in the absence of anything to the contrary, we don't have a, a technical response from any other person as far as drainage is concerned. So, in my view, you have to rely on the technical advice that you've been given by the land drainage engineer. And as I say, you can be reassured that there is a condition on the outline permission that requires that detail to be submitted and approved before works commence on the site. Just to answer Councillor Bowen's other point as far as um, where we might stand were you to refuse planning permission, the simple answer to that is it would very much depend on what reasons you decided if you decided to refuse planning permission. Um, and what reasons you would use to what the outcome of the kill would be. What I would say to you very clearly is the principle of development on this site has been accepted. So you can't backtrack and say that the principle of development is now not acceptable. Um, it's also an allocated site in the NDP, um, as with the previous application where we had the similar debate. Um, so I, I don't want to preempt the, the, the debate, um, but you must think very carefully um, in terms of how you move forward with the application and um, any any resolution that members might consider, which is contrary to the officer recommendation to approve. Chair, thank you, Councillor Norman. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my, some of my concerns have already been raised and uh, Mr Banks has responded and it is reassuring to know that there are some conditions which would have to be met before anything at all could go ahead. Um, I think like the implication of other comments, one wonders how this got permission really and particularly in relation to the access, I gather at the time there was an alternative possible other access which now seemed to be lost with the um, the transfer of the land to new owners so we can't really go over that to a great extent um the flooding is obviously of huge concern and entirely understandable clearly there needs to be a, a, a really comprehensive plan with all the detail that's been referred to by the local member in, uh, implemented but one of the things that doesn't seem to be included is a reference to a more natural sort of flood management which is planting we could have masses more planting. I know it's a narrow site, but it's actually a very large site and possibly to include some significant amount of planting um, could be one of the ways, it wouldn't solve the whole problem, but it could be one of the ways of reducing the flooding and the water um, you know, problem that is, is there. So I would suggest that we perhaps have a look at that. Um, the other concern is the whole ghastly prospect of the construction process and that i understand also is is pretty grim for local people and i think there needs to be a, a site management plan a clearly you know detailed plan of how that's going to be managed including the parking the removal or not and i get i think i got the picture that a lot a lot of the waste is likely to be absorbed into the site in some way interesting to know how that's going to happen and the quality of that waste and you know how it'll affect the, the site, but I think that needs to be um, you know clearly planned for management plan and, and all the rest in place. Um, finally, on a positive note, uh, the sustainable design is very welcome. Really interesting features uh, should be mandatory, should be standard as far as I'm concerned, but we don't always get it, and it's 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 to be applauded that it is there. I think the flooding and the site management in particular are the issues which we need to be reassured are fully, um, you know, the conditions will cover all this. And I, and I do hope some note might be taken of the possible planting to help reduce the runoff. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Watson. Um, yes, I didn't realise. Um, we're not sharing notes, I have to say, because I, ha I also have um, my. What fascinates me is that it's a four bedroom house and there's one car parked outside. You know, that's the one thing that struck me is, um, is you know, as someone who really loves, um, you know, tiny houses. And um, I was just wondering also about the usage of natural flood management systems in wet sites, you know, like bog gardens, using sedum roofs, a, a green living roof to also stop 
additional surface runoff um, off road. Um, I think that for me, I'm erring on looking at deferring to get a much better landscape plan of using more natural ways of capturing water on the side, creating, you know, like wet systems, reed systems, where it could be used as habitat. So really enhancing the impact. I think that it's about the, what I get really frustrated, frustrated, and I'm not standing for re-election, is the lack of innovative thinking and creative thinking. And actually, you know, we're still getting bog standard housing. Yes, it's great to have, you know, some ecological and climate change with, you know, solar roof, solar. Um, but I think that we really need to become climate resistant. So I would like to see, you know, a green living roof. I'd like to see the channel and the soak away. I'd like to see bog gardens. And um, with the rainwater harvesting, what, what's going to, if there's plenty of water on the land, why do we, you know, what's the purpose of the rain <coughs> harvesting? It could, you know, be a capture point for actually going into a pond. So that's where I'm going with this, is to defer it for a much more, um, um, a landscape plan that is really suitable for wetlands. You know, we could learn so much more from our colleagues in Wales, from the One Planet Development, who actually build in, you know, wet areas, and um, and we could really draw from their expertise. So, sorry about that. Can I just say we are a planning committee, not a design committee. Mm -hmm. um, and whatever we would like to be there, we have no powers to do that. Uh, we have to consider the application on, on the, under our current uh, policies and rules and decide if it meets those. If it doesn't, it has to be pretty strong. We can, we can refuse it. But to say we'd like something better is not a not an ob ob I'm sharing ideas. Ob object. Yeah, I, 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 I <laughs> Councillor Shaw. Oh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, like the like the um, ward member, I picked up page eighty, paragraph uh, three. I think talked about the drainage channel and surface water would be directed to an existing soakaway area. It actually says an existing soakaway area. Well, I couldn't see one. I can't see one in any, any of the drawings. So the, the planning officer might, might be able to direct me to, to where this existing soakaway area actually is. Um, so I think this this issue of um, calculating somehow what the runoff of that site is going to be and whether the existing um, provision, um, whether it be on the, the, uh, the land itself or on land uh, that's below this land, because riparian rights say you've got to deal with the runoff from, from land above you as, as, it, as it arrives, um, needs to be done. So I think what we're being told is condition 12 covers this. Um, we have to put trust in, in officers and, and, and you know the capability of doing that calculation. I would imagine that, and we're not designing it, but some sort of sub scheme is going to be almost required because if there's a, a flash, a lot of rain, that's going to come off this, this long, narrow strip quite quickly. Um, but that would be for the designers to, to, to come up with. In terms of the construction, I can see this being a nightmare. We had difficulty parking when we visited the site. We only, we, we know that, you know, when you have trades visiting the site, you, you, they'll be parking wherever they can find a, uh, an inch of verge. Um, so I'd like to see the site management plan, which is required, include an off-site materials area and parking area. Um, and if it's at all possible, I'd like a no loading zone for 200 meters either side of that entrance to keep that road clear for the local people. I think that 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 would at least give give you know the local population some reassurance that um, it's not the, the actual building of this if if this is what we decide um, isn't going to cause huge uh, destruction to to their to their life um, and I don't know whether um, temporary um, prohibition of, of loading for for lengths is something that um, we can ask for. But, it's a temporary TRO or whatever, uh, we, we get that by. But but otherwise I can see, you know, vans, well, we all know what it's going to be like, don't we? Yes. 
we, we park there um, so we know what it's going to be like and, it, and it's not acceptable. Mm. Rose, do you want to make a comment? Yes, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just to try and capture a few of the points that have been raised, um, just to qualify on the drainage channel and the reference in the both in the technical drainage report, uh, the second one that is, and also in the our land drainage engineers comments with reference to this existing soakaway and a drainage channel at the bottom of the driveway essentially. So obviously we've gone through many iterations of this. We've had two drainage engineers commissioned by the applicant to look at the site and carry out various groundwater testing, percolation testing, infiltration testing. Um, as part of those discussions with our engineer, um, it was highlighted that you know local concern, the church commissioners were saying, yeah, we've got a drainage ditch along our verge essentially below the field to the south of the site. But you don't have a right to discharge into that. So the applicant has taken that on board and therefore replaced their, their uh, drainage strategy, which, which you see on the drawing. So to negate the need for that. So, so what you have before you is essentially an engineered soak away within the driveway. So we've gone from a sort of a more focused um, surface water attenuation area to the whole driveway, 265 meters squared of it, um, at a depth of 450 millimeters, um, essentially acting as a soakaway. Along along that, what they're showing is um, what's called check downs at three meter intervals to sort of slow any rate of, of, of runoff from that land. So. The calculations have been done on the basis of a, a one in a hundred year event with a 40% allowance for climate change. Um, and we're not requiring the developer to, to have to resolve all of the existing um, problem. You know, I think it's acknowledged, I've seen it myself, there is some seepage from that bank onto the neighbor's property, onto the driveway. So, so the applicant is doing their the best to try and mitigate that um, with this Sokoi solution, with the retaining wall to the neighboring site. Um, and the aspiration is that, that, that we don't make the, the situation any worse through this development. Um, to reiterate what Mr. Banks has said, yes, we've got that sort of fallback of the condition 12 on the, end, on the outline. What I'm asking you to consider really is, is there sufficient comfort in what you've seen um, in terms of this having been through uh, our very rigorous engineers in terms of looking at the strategy, what we've got before us currently, that our solution can be delivered and I think the fact we've got a gravity fed solution, we're not having to pump it uphill anymore. Um, yes, I take on board uh, what some of the councillors said about the more naturalised solutions. Perhaps, I, I, I don't I simply don't know whether that could be achieved, but we have a solution before us that looks feasible, and that's what your technical constancy is telling you. Um, just to turn to the, I guess, to the construction issues, yeah, uh, fully acknowledge that, that there, you know, this is a narrow site with a narrow entrance point. Um, in terms of the access width, it is. It does meet our design guide. It's it's more than desirable. Three point two. Um, we don't have to achieve five meters here. As, as some sites where you need two way traffic. Um, we appreciate joint construction with these large vehicles. That is going to prove a, a challenge. Um, we have granted planning permission. That's the point here. We have granted permission. We've accepted the development of a single dwelling house on this plot. Um, we've got conditions on the outline in terms of restriction of construction working hours. We've got a construction management plan condition. I've proposed to sort of uh, reinforce that condition three in the recommended conditions. Um, the only other thing that's, that's sort of come up today in terms of adding to that, adding another layer of, of sort of comfort perhaps, is um, disposal of waste. So obviously the, 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 the agent has told us that they might well spread some of this earth um, within the back back garden essentially but obviously if, if there is something that needs to be disposed of you know you could have that comfort of additional condition if members saw that as being necessary thank you okay councillor Rowe. thank you chair um standing on site yesterday I, personally i was amazed that this site never gained consent but uh, we are where we are uh, councillor shaw mentioned uh, a lot of runoff it, not only is it going to go downhill, it's going to go sideways. And the um, the farm buildings that are left as we look down the site yesterday, it's, it's got to be a metre, a metre and a half below the level we are now. <coughs> I do have a question coming up, I, I promise that. We've got to give a huge amount of weight to the drainage issues. Uh, 
the effect of, of poor planning on the neighbours, it, it, it could be really to the point of affecting their lives. If we don't get this right. We trust in the uh, conditions that we've heard. And I think because of how vigorous and how um, respected our land drainage officers are, we, we have to we have to put an arm around their shoulder and say, we trust you. But my question is, uh, regarding the finished floor level, uh, in 6.14, has the height of the building been reduced or has the um, <coughs> finished floor level been reduced? It says it's it's come down by 1.5 metres. I think the, the parish council said by 50 centimetres. I think the agent said 1.5 and our details say 1.5 so has, have we actually just dropped the building one and a half meters into the on the site or has the building been reduced by one and a half meters okay just to respond to that but in terms of the building height setting aside the topography yes that that's been reduced so we've had a building height of say i don't know 8.1 8.2 as originally submitted 15 months ago we now have a dwelling 6.7, 6.75 of, of height um, at the one corner. In terms of the topography, yes, I think we've, we understand that it's, it's to be cut into that slope at that point and where we stood, you could see there was a, a slightly more gradual slope, I guess. Um, but that said, yeah, it has been pushed back uphill during the application process to get this gravity fed drainage solution to overcome our constantees concerns. We've had to push it back uphill, we've had no choice. Um, so it's, it's the lesser of the evils, in my view, to have it further back up the hill. Okay, and the other, if I can indulge you, Chair, uh, we stood there yesterday underneath the uh, spreading branches of that tree. Um, it, 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 I think it needs highlighting in, in, in a committee about whether that tree is going to be just deboughed or whether it's going to be trimmed up, as my dad used to say, level with the floor. I, I don't know if it's that, that tree is within the the site, if it's bordering on the site, I mean, I know you can trim it up if it's affecting you, but I, I just, something like that really needs highlighting. Yeah, yeah understood. And I think, um, I think I might have mentioned it in the report, but ultimately, uh, I think most of the hedgerow along that side is, is within the site, but I think that particular tree that we noted during our visit perhaps did, did cross the boundary line, as it were. Um, <coughs> setting aside any potential dispute over who might own that tree then, um, I think any land, adjoining landowner is entitled to a lot some branches off on a turn to the neighbour, even if it was a neighbouring tree, if, they, if it falls over your land. Um, it's undesirable, I think I've acknowledged that, that we, we have to sanction some tree production. But it's again, it's a necessary evil to accommodate development that we've already been planning permission for. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Bowen. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Does this imply that this application after the problems have been allegedly and hopefully resolved will they come back to the committee for final approval or is this it this is it really in terms of reserve matters this would be your decision in terms of the condition 12 and the drainage matters that would be essentially an officer matter however obviously liaise with a local member uh, at that stage thank you Right, I, I don't have any further speakers. Um, I don't have a proposal. Can I have a proposal? There are none. Have cuts and put forth. Sorry, Council wants to put forward a proposal for a deferral, but she has to put a second for that. Yeah, we That's did that. Yeah. I'll second that. Right, we have what a. What is your proposal? It's to defer for um, a, an improved landscape plan uh, with more detail about um, yeah, flooding, flooding and drainage, yeah, mitigation. So basically, a deferral. I would support that. You've got a second. My only concern with deferring the application on those grounds is precisely 
what we're intending that for. You mentioned um, improving landscaping on <coughs> essentially drainage grounds, yet we have a condition on an outline permission, as we've said, that deals with drainage matters. You have the beginnings of a technical solution. You've heard Mr. Rowell say that the property has been pushed further back up the hill in order to accommodate a drainage solution. Um, I'm, I'm not sure quite what the expectation is in terms of a deferral and what that would achieve, if, if I'm being absolutely honest. Yeah. But Country, absolutely. Yeah, um, I don't know whether this will provide a, a way through. Um, the report clearly says a drainage channel will be constructed. <clears throat> I think we've been told it will not be constructed, uh, in which case the report is wrong. Uh, it needs to be rewritten to make it clear that uh, it will not be. Uh, and I would like confirmation from the, dra from, from the drainage BBLP people that it is not necessary anymore. Because when I, when I saw the some of the plans uh, a month or so back, I did note that the, the line of the drain goes down the road and then stops. And, and I thought to myself, well, where on earth does the water go? And I think um, the officer and I had a bit of a discussion about it and I was told, well, no, you know, there's, a, there's enough space up that drive to act as a soak away. Well, it's just that the report doesn't, doesn't say that. The report actually says there will be a a, uh, a, a, a drainage tunnel. Now, I, I don't know whether uh, officers can can do that. Is in, in a way that's a ground for 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 with, for for um, uh, for, for the term, the deferring, because there's a there's an error in the in, in the report. report. Yeah, um, thank you, Councillor uh, Um I think fully understand that you know that is the drainage uh, engineer's comments. It appears to be an oversight in their comments that they they. It was still thought that that was proposed, but um, the drawing doesn't indicate it as everybody's picked up on. Um, we've got condition 12, ultimately. I think I'm still of the mindset that there is sufficient reassurance here that drainage can be attempted to be accommodated on site. Um, but if you did, if you were going as well minded to defer, then we can get a clarification from our engineer on that specific point. Um, I don't know if you wish to see an updated drainage report in terms of just correcting the, that discrepancy. Um, but in terms of like rejigging re the, the drainage layout, is, is that a suggestion or is that? Because I'm not, I'm not sure this has already been through about three or four iterations um, to get to this point. I'm not sure how much difference we're going to get through the yeah. referral maybe. Councillor Watson, Julie. Yeah, I think the thing for me is um, it's about having it public facing. I think that when it's left, you know, it's not um, to be disrespectful, it's about because there are so many concerns from the residents about the impact of flooding onto their properties and onto the highway. I think it's the reassurance to actually have the drawings that really reflect the report and at the same time to integrate more natural flood management systems to maximize. And I think that hopefully the conversation with the applicant being in the room will also inform that. And it's about the construction management plan as well, about what to actually we can include within the uh, construction management plan. Um, so I think that that's the reasons for the deferral is to really make it very clear and to assure the parish council and residents that you know um yeah to expose i've had the situation in my own ward so i mean that you know um we have got a, a drainage <coughs> issue with surface water flooding onto a highway uh flooding through um, manure heaps and it's causing huge amount of problems but we've got nowhere to turn because it's had outline permission as well Thanks. right um bear in mind this is a deferral <coughs> so we don't need to come back to necessarily to you can we just resolve this whether we defer or we go on to a, resolve the actual planning application there is a resolution now of a deferral um, can i ask those in favor of a deferral please one two three four five six seven eight ten it's ten
10 in favour. Any against? Abstentions? Three abstentions. Okay, well that is moved. We'll move now quickly on to the next item. Uh, <coughs> <time>. <coughs> oh, right. Wait a couple of moments. We've got an officer taking a couple of breaks. Eight application eight uh, concerns Prior Farm, Stoke Prior, Lemster, Herefordshire. Proposed alteration and development of existing equine facilities to form a new door, indoor arena, stabling, and an essential worker dwelling. Officer presentation. Right. We now move. I'll move back to the. Um, can the local members? Uh, the the applicants uh, speak public speakers. I believe uh, Mr. Chatwin. Mr. Chatwin. Mr. 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 Just just Mr. Mr. Thomas. Just Mr. Yeah. Thomas. Just Mr. Thomas. All right. Just Mr. Thomas. Um, not Mr. Priest. Uh, a speaker who taken your place at the public gallery. Um, the ward member is Councillor Harrington, who is in place. Right. We'll begin with the presentation. Officer Prentice, Mr. Andy Jones. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, can you check out if you can hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I would first and foremost um, draw members' attention to the committee update sheet. This includes whether a party comments submitted from the officer report, um, which in this case is an updated version of the report presented to members of this committee on the 9th of February 2022. A rebuttal statement from the applicant's agent is also included, which makes reference to the draft section 106 agreement and manual management plan submitted to the authority in January. Members will be aware that this application has been brought back to this committee for consideration following being considered at this committee on the 9th of February 2022. The application was recommended for two reasons. The application is made in full and seeks planning permission for alterations and development of an existing equine facility known as Priory Farm Equine Centre. It would include a new indoor riding arena, further stabling together with an equine worker swelling. The existing centre offers delivery and a range of tuition to suit clients' requirements. <coughs> Officers would at this point also advise members that because the dwelling has been constructed, it, is, it should be noted that the application is now made retrospectively. <coughs> As indicated on the site, the end on the slide, the site is located at elevation at elevation to the immediate north of Stoke Prior. Access to the site is by an existing track through Prior Farm, taken from the minor road, which leads northeast from the village towards the primary school. And then this next slide, please. So this just shows the site marked edge red, with the remainder of the applicant's land holding edged in blue. And if we come to the next slide, please. So, in February 2022, the application was presented to this committee with a recommendation for refusal. And in terms of context, it's just useful to remind members of the committee with respect to what those reasons were at the time. Um, so, on the slide, you'll note the first reason, and that related to the fact that the application site lies within the river like subcatchment of the River Y. And the nature of the proposal was such that triggered the requirement for habitat regulations assessment to be undertaken. 
Under those regulations, there was a requirement to establish with certainty and beyond all reasonable scientific doubt that there would not be any adverse effect on the integrity of the River Wine SAC. Officers considered that the proposal in this case would add to the generation of additional power water for phosphate through both an intensification of the equine enterprise, result, resulting in increased amounts of manure, and that the local planning authority was, was at the time unable to conclude that the development would not have an adverse effect on the River Log SAC. And then, if we move on to the next slide. The second re reason for refusal at the time disputed the need for the introduction of a permanent rural workers dwelling here on the basis that officers considered the need of the enterprise could be met through an on-site presence during the day combined with even checks and security systems. So if we go on to the next slide please. This committee resolved to grant planning permission with the essential need for the development in its proposed location being established and the delegated authority could be provided to officers to apply conditions to the planning permission and approve the strategy in consultation with the chairman of the planning committee and the local ward member. In essence, this meant that a suitable drainage strategy was required and for officers to apply suitable conditions. Following the committee, a foul drainage strategy for the dwelling was received and subsequently reviewed by the council's land drainage team together with the planning ecology team. And it was found that the strategy would comply with the interim position statement relating to small discharges and therefore that element of the proposal could demonstrate mutual neutrality. However, because the local planning authority, as the competent, competent authority, are required to consider all likely significant effects of a plan or project in order to undertake the requisite habitat regulations assessment, consideration must also be given to the additional nutrient pathways associated through increased saving provision, which is also proposed as part of the application or the project. With this, an appropriate assessment of the project was undertaken by the local planning authority, the competent authority, where it was concluded that because of the inability to demonstrate that the intensification of the equine element would be mutual, neutral, neutral there, would be, there would be an adverse effect on the integrity of the River Lug and Y SAC. This was submitted to Natural England, who corroborated the authority's conclusions in that regard. Since the applicant has attempted to demonstrate mutual neutrality with respect to the increase in manure which will be generated from the project as a result of the increased stabling, this has included a manure management plan and a draft section 106 agreement. These have been reviewed by officers and are considered flawed as set out within the comments made by the planning ecology team. Similarly, the transporting manure off site as proposed would still remain within the hydrological catchment of the river lug. Similarly, should it be transported out of catchment, there would remain insufficient control over external variables, including the status of other river catchments and their associated ecological rate related constraints in order to demonstrate mutual neutrality with a legal and scientific certainty. Because of this, the draft section 106 agreement does not provide the required level of certainty to demonstrate that the project in its entirety would be nutrient neutral. Furthermore, the applicant asserts that the site has previously housed a significant number of equine, totaling 100 horses. The stated area of land available to the equestrian use is to has a total of around 12 hectares, um, either owned or, or through a, a tenancy agreement. As detailed by the Planning College team in their May 2022 comments, it is understood that the, say, the scale of the land holding is sufficient in accommodating the existing 60 horses and potentially a small increase, but not the 100 horses referred to, and that being used as the current baseline to try and demonstrate a reduction in horses on site and in turn of nutrient neutrality. The habitat regulations assessment must be based on certainty, and the current certainty provided by the available stored saving capacity is that for 16 permanent horses. As advised by the planning and ecology team, Planning permission can only be granted if there, are scientific, if there is scientific certainty that no unmitigated phosphate pathways exist, that being referred to as nutrient neutrality, and that the habitat re regulation assessment process can confirm no adverse effect on the integrity of the river log by SAC. Whilst acknowledging the un understandably challenging circumstances relating to the application, officers have attempted to work positively with, that, with the applicant's agent over the past 14 months. This includes advice to the applicant of detaching the operative parts of the proposal and submitting a new application for the dwelling alone, 
which of itself has been able to demonstrate mutual neutrality. This unfortunately has not been taken up by the applicant. Therefore, regrettably in this instance, it has not been possible, because of the increased statement provision proposed, to demonstrate that the project would be mutual neutrality in its entirety. Therefore, officers are unable to progress the application positively. In accordance with the Local Planning Authority's obligations under the Conservation of Habitats and Species Regulations, um, it would therefore not be lawful to grant planning permission where an adverse effect on the integrity of a protected site has been identified. As such, on the basis of the previous resolution by made, this, by, made by this committee, committee cannot be fulfilled, the application is returned and recommended for refusal, as set out in the foot of the updated officer report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And now I'll ask the speaker, the, the agent for the applicant, Mr. Thomas, to make a presentation for the applicant. You have three minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman and esteemed planning committee members. Uh, on behalf of the applicant, I speak in support of the proposed development, which you previously approved in February 2022, stating, I quote, planning permission be granted, the essential need for the development in its proposed location have been established and delegated authority be provided to officers to apply conditions to the Commission and approve a drainage strategy in consultation with the Chairman of the Planning Committee and the Board Member." End quote. Conditions should be agreed by Planning Officers with the Chairman and the Local Board Member. Although Planning Officers have been unable to reconcile the NPPF and Habitat regulations in the north of the county, the Parish Council and several members of the public also continue to support the development. I urge the committee to consider the wide scope of powers available to you when imposing conditions on the Planning Commission. Appendix A of Circular 11 of 95 outlines a suitable condition at paragraph 32, which could read as follows. No development shall take place until a schedule of landscape management as set out in a section 106 agreement has been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. The section 106 agreement shall include details of the arrangements of its implementation. Development shall be carried out in accordance with the section 106 agreement in perpetuity. A draft section 106 agreement is deposited with the local authority that will ensure a high level of site management of equine manure in compliance with Regulation 63.6 of the Conservation of Habitat Species Regulations 2017, which incidentally does allow planning conditions. The agreement would be within the control of the Council in perpetuity, and notwithstanding the negligible phosphate content of horse manure, would offer long-term benefit to the Lug and River Wide Sack. I draw attention to the fact residential foul drainage in the proposal is satisfied and the applicant can demonstrate phosphate neutrality in relation to equine practice. The applicant continues to achieve a high equine standard as reported by Frontier, a body that upholds DEFRA and EPA regulations. In conclusion, Chairman, I strongly urge the committee to agree this condition for the development and bring the site under effective planning control to reduce the historic number of horses from 110 to just 28. This will significantly lower potential phosphate and safeguard the River Lug and Y SAC. Supporting this proposal will ensure compliance with regulations and standards and, in, and secure long-term benefits for the community and the environment. Thank you for your attention and your support. Okay, thank you. If you could just take your place back in the... The local member is Councillor Hat John Harrington, he is a ward member. He speaks first and has the right to speak at the end of the meeting. He does not have a vote. Ten minutes is the time limit. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. I hopefully will not take that to ten minutes. But, um, as we all as <laughs> So this is uh, an unusual one. I let's let's put it like that. I mean we we we, we sat before us all um, a year or so ago and agreed that on the basis that we felt as committee members an occupational need was satisfied that we would give permission for this small um, house to be built with a conference room. 
We also agreed that we would allow an increase in the amount of stables that are up there to support the proposed increase in the size of the business. We had, as has been already said, demonstrated that the HRA with regard to domestic uh, personal power of waste has been satisfied as a like for like exchange. But then in a sense, we had the issue perhaps slightly spring up un unexpected, um, not, not as far as officers are concerned, I, I appreciate them probably say they were on it, well they were on it, but in terms of, of, of my view and other people's view, um, we had the issue then spring up of the re removal of, of manure. Now, horse manure has far less phosphate in it than chicken manure, for example. It doesn't cause the same issue, but we understand that of course it is still an, an increase that has to be considered if we are uh, agreeing to the increase in stabling in the horses. Um, the, the, the issue comes down to really of certainty. So our ecologist does not believe uh, with planning officers that we can provide certainty that this manure will be managed in a way that prevents it likely getting into the catchment area in some way and increasing, however small, the amount of phosphate going into the river. I remain of the view that a decent section 106 agreement, which we didn't discuss explicitly the last time, although we did mention it in discussing how we would resolve drainage and I think access issues, which I still want to make sure that we maintain um, that requirement around access and good landscape, including the retention of some trees. But in relation to the manure, the, the issue has been that we've been going backwards and forwards uh, somewhat, and I, I'm not you know, apportioning any uh, blame to anyone in regards to this, whether the applicants were able to do things in time or whether we were able to respond. I think we, we've, we've, we, you know, we've done what we can. It's been a slightly unusual one. The issue for me is that can we, with certainty, and if I just go back briefly to what was um, provided at the time was, was a, as a letter from a farmer or a landowner in an adjoining area near Bockleton, which is outside of the catchment, saying that he would collect the manure. Now, we all, we all agree that's not enough certainty for anyone, and we, we, we push that aside. The Section 106 agreement has been drawn up. Uh, it's a draft agreement. Obviously, it could be improved, and, and perhaps that's part of the process to make sure that that manure is collected, that it is taken off the site, and that we provide certainty through a legal agreement that that is then removing the risk of extra phosphate going into the river. In fact, it would provide betterment, because if we, uh, if we oblige the applicant to sign at the Section 106, they will be taking all the manure that is currently able to be discharged into the catchment as it is right now. And I think it's important for us to remember as, as a council that what we expect in terms of an agreement is not that we second guess perhaps every single possibility of what might happen or if things are taken off site or if things change. What we need to be certain of is, is a legal agreement sufficiently strong enough to require the applicants to make sure that they are held to that agreement and if they're not held to that agreement that there are consequences. That for me is the important issue, not, and then that would provide for me the certainty rather than expecting every final extrapolation of possibilities. The other thing that's interesting is that uh, technically at the moment, the applicant could turn up with 300 horses on that site. Um, it might be impractical in terms of trying to feed them and, and stable them and get them all surrounded, but they could do that. By agreeing to this planning permission and by agreeing to a Section 106 agreement, we bring this area under development control. We bring it underneath the control of the council. We are able then, therefore, to have a stronger uh, influence on how we manage the HRA and protect our, our habitat. Um, and, and for all those reasons, um, in my view, I still support this application. And I, I, I'm unsure of how we can proceed with a way to make sure that um, we can resolve this essentially. Just one final thing which needs <laughs> clarification. We have, I thought we agreed in February or whenever it was last year that we were granting planning permission subject to conditions being kind of discharged or discussed. I believe what actually we did was, was make a resolution to allow planning permission once and if drainage was discharged. So I just want clarity from the members on that. I think that's correct. Sorry. Yeah, the committee made a resolution, um, and yeah, 
is back for you to consider today yeah. because that resolution can't be met. Can't be met at the moment, precisely. Thank you, Mr. Banks. And that, that's the difficulty. And and so I'm not entirely sure in a sense, sometimes you know, precisely what this is, quite frankly, Chairman. But uh, my own personal view for the sake of, and I appreciate all the work that officers have done, I, I do not think they have failed to do their duty in the way the best they can. Uh, but my, my view is that we have a proposal. Um, I don't see why we cannot achieve certitude through a Section 106 that has sufficient strength to make sure that we allow this application to be actually granted and then it be subject to that, uh, to be subject to drainage conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Bowie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I remember this, this side well, and we decided, I think quite rightly, that this was a, a reasonable thing to have this little house, uh, because horses do require 24-hour management, especially in great numbers, and that was fine. And I thought we'd also manage to solve the, the manure problem too. I know that any sensible horse owner is absolutely resolute in picking up every dropping that possibly can be and put in a safe place away from um, any likelihood of going into the Y. Uh, and I'm sure these people do the same, and certainly they should be encouraged to do so. And also, if we can get a, as, as the local member said, if we can get a, a really solid Section 106 agreement that the farmer will take away the manure on a very regular basis, uh, I think that will be sufficient for us. We are crippling this whole enterprise, I think. Uh, I think the number of horses down to 28 is probably sensible as well. It's only a limited area of um, grassland that they have. Uh, not that they will be on the grassland all the time, but when they are, it should be decent in a decent condition, not just uh, mown down to the bare stumps of the grass and full of muck. Uh, so really, if we, if we need to know can we get this Section 106 agreement agreed? Is there any great legal uh, difficulty in it? Surely not. We do plenty of other Section 106s. They don't always work, but we should make sure we actually monitor them and make sure they do work. And then I think we could all be happy, sleep quietly in our beds, knowing that everything will be very, very comfortable with this particular agreement. Mr. Banks. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, a simple answer to your question, Councillor Bowen, is we've spent 14 months trying to secure a suitably worded Section 106 agreement, and we haven't been able to do that. No, Ollie has worked exceptionally no, hard. Ollie has worked exceptionally hard to try and secure a resolution. Um, I draw your attention to the comments from um, the ecologist in the original report. Um, uh, and not the original review or data report, May uh, 2022. Um, and he says, it is unlikely that the shipping of additional manure created out of catchment, as is currently stated, can be demonstrated for the lifetime of the development with required certainty, monitoring and enforcement. So what you've got to assure yourselves of today is whether or not, with certainty, this development will have an impact on the River Wysak. And this, the advice that you're being given by our ecologist, by Natural England as well, no, is that no, it's in the report. No, Can I please, please? That's the advice that you have been given by the ecologist and by Natural England. So we can't demonstrate with absolute certainty that there will be no unmitigated effects on the river wise sank. So you've been asked to consider this application again on that basis. We've not taken the decision lightly to bring it back to committee. Um, as I've said, the past 14 months, uh, we've been trying to come to a solution and Mr. Jones has offered ways forward to resolve that. As you've heard, the dwelling itself can demonstrate nutrient neutrality. And we've offered the opportunity of a separate application to be submitted to be considered for that. That option hasn't been taken up. So we're in the situation that we're in today. And in my view, the matter needs to have a line drawn under it one way or another. Um, I would also highlight, and um, Mr. Thomas referred to Regulation 63 um, for the HRA um, assessment. 
Regulation 63 says that a competent authority may agree to a plan or project only after having ascertained that it will not adversely affect the integrity of the European site. So yes, you could impose conditions on the basis that you ascertain with certainty that there is no adverse effect on the River White Sack and we're not in that position and that's why the application is back before you with the recommendation for a review. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Shaw. Chairman, how can we get that certainty then? What procedure, what process? And do we need to give a little more time so the, both the applicants and the council can be satisfied that things will be okay? As I've said, we've spent the last 14 months trying to get to that point and we haven't been able to. So, I'm sorry, you have not, Mr. Banks. Can, can we then give them perhaps another couple of months to come to some sound and logical conclusion that will give us all certainty? Just be a little bit, shall we say, generous in our having taken 14 months. What's another two months? <coughs> Mr. Banks. <laughs> I think 14 months is more than adequate time, Councillor Bowen. Well, it proves it's not adequate Sorry. time yet. Can we, can we just give them two more months to come to some certain agreement but, but what, and then, what, then we can reason, sign this off or not? What is it that you think you need to have us write it? Yeah. I'm sorry, we can't have a public participation in this from the gallery. Right. So, Councillor Mill, oh, Councillor Norman, I, sorry. I think, I think Councillor uh, Watson got ahead of me. Oh, no, it's not Councillor Shaw. Actually, it's Councillor Shaw got ahead of me. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Chair. I, I, I just wanted to, um, it's a bit naivety on my part, perhaps, but I just wanted to go back to, to, some, to some basics so I understand it. So, so we're talking about um, uh, an expansion of a, a stables uh, riding school effectively an intensification of use. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I understood that intensification isn't a material um, planning matter as laid down um, in, uh, if it's not changing the character of uh, an activity or, or place. Um, now, it would be my conjecture that you'd be very brave to go before um, a court and suggest that changing from 12 horses to 22 is changing a character. If you went from 12 to 200, maybe, yes, I'd, I'd agree with you. So the, the, the number, to my mind, the number of horses as they are at the moment, be it 12, 22, is not a planning issue. And, and I'm, I'm not... I, I, because we're making it a planning issue, we're getting hung up about the amount of manure that we're creating. So can I have some, some I don't know whether Kerry would, would, would direct me on that, but, but you know, it, it, it states in various places that intensification is not planning. Sorry, Andrew, can come back and tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> you have to consider the plan or, plan or project as a whole, and the application before you is not just for the dwelling, it is for the associated stabling and the equestrian use. So you have to consider that in its entirety, irrespective, um, as you've said about it, in terms of numbers of courses. The fact of the matter is the project as a whole brings about that intensification. So in my view, you have to consider that. You can't separate out the two. But, but intensification isn't material planning matter. So my conjecture is that it, it shouldn't be considered. So, thank you, thank you, Chairman. In screening the application, in the first stage of screening the application, you identify what those likely significant effects are of that plan and project. So, in this case, there's foul water from the drainage, uh, from the dwelling, surface water from the dwelling, but also because the project includes the intensification of the existing enterprise, uh, the existing enterprise, there's the increase in manure from the equine. So whilst it's not it separately required planning permission, under the habitat regulations, we have to screen for what the likely significant effects are, and that is one of them. So that's why that's why we're considering it. Thank you. Right. 
Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Norman and then Councillor Watson. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. And uh, once again, we have a very difficult and controversial um, application and obviously sympathies are with the <laughs> who want to get on with their business. That's, that's clearly understood. But we also have a massively serious uh, issue in terms of the potential impact on our river, which over many, many years has got worse and worse and worse. And not only has the river itself been massively impacted and damaged, but also um, development has. Builders have been at a standstill for two years, unable to develop, unable for their businesses to develop. Uh, it's, it's hugely serious. We cannot brush it aside. Now, I'm really disturbed that it's taken um, so lightly by some people. Um, so I think we have to listen to our ecologists, we have to listen to Natural England, we have no choice in that matter, and we'd be utterly, utterly irresponsible to ignore that in my view. Um, I have one or two quick questions. One is I do not understand why the application for a dwelling hasn't been taken separately. It appears that could meet the requirements and that could be resolved. So I'm not clear on why that hasn't been sorted. And then the other two points really are the extra condition that was proposed by the um, applicant's agent. Um, why now? Why has it not been sorted and you know resolved before it comes to us here? And also the same with the management, the manure plan, the management of the waste plan. That seems to me all perfectly reasonable to expect those to be resolved, sorted, and brought to us um, as a means of enabling us to support what everyone would like to see, which is the further development and progress of this obviously popular business. So I cannot support uh, uh, an approval here because we have this huge, hugely serious issue that we cannot ignore. Um, but I very much hope that in some way um, it can be resolved and you know, eventually permission given, but not today from, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Mr. Chairman, could I propose a deferral until this matter is sorted out? As I requested before, if you're given two months to sort this matter out, it shouldn't take that long, surely. Even allowing for the law's delay and the incidents of office. Have you got a seconder for that? Do I have a seconder? Councillor okay. Shaw. Can I just, Can I just put it over? Because I was in line to speak after Councillor Norman and Councillor Bowen butted in. Mm. So I, it's a point of order, actually, Chair, because there was already a line of people to be questioned. And my recommendation was going to be supporting officer recommendation. Well, and, and that's why I'm annoyed. All right, you know, we are my apologies. <laughs> but anyway, look, we have a proposal for deferment, which has been proposed and seconded. Can I ask those in favour of that? One, two, three. Five. Those against? One, two, three, four, five, six. Abstentions. Abstentions. One, two. So that's, that's lost. That's lost. Now we go to. Can I say my piece? Yeah. I, I think that it, it's a it's a technicality, and I think that you know we just have to be really mindful again. We are public facing, and what we are arguing about. We talk about nutrient neutrality. We speak about it in our planning applications and. We, you know, we've got, I think that we have to be very careful. And in this case, I, and I know it won't be a popular decision, but I can see the separation of the house and the actual intensification would be a benefit and it would also simplify things too. So I, I support officer recommendation and that is my proposal. That's a proposal. Second, 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 second. Right. I do you want to speak at all? Done. Well, um, I, I'm almost out of time, but I, will, I was simply going to say, which, uh, broadly speaking, I said in when we considered this application in February last year, that um, because I'd uh, arrived at the site meeting on foot, 
and left it on foot by the public footpaths, uh, I was able to get a rather better look at the operation. And there's a footpath that runs uh, from where we had our site meeting uh, around the top of a, of a steep wooded dingle over the uh, over the village, uh, uh, around I suppose the the west and the south side. And about a hundred yards before I came back onto the track that you guys had driven up, there was the most enormous clamp of horse manure, which uh, uh, clearly uh, was uh, quite, in my opinion, vulnerable to uh, leaching into into the brook below. And I, I, I commented on this, and uh, I, I think uh, one of the other members said, well, uh, uh, the phosphate problem from horse manure isn't nearly so significant as it is from poultry manure. But there are other nitrates, uh, there are other uh, nutrients in horse manure, like nitrates and potassium, which are a concern if they get in the, in the water courses. And so I do support officer recommendation uh, on, on, on this. On this, app, on this application to to refuse. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Do, do you want just before to say anything further? Councillor. Thank you, Chairman, and yes. thank you all for your thoughts and views. Uh, just in relation to Jeremy's point, at the moment that clamp can continue as it as it is and can, can continue in size as it is because it is not under planning control and it is under certain regulations that are compliant at present in terms of the spreading of manure through. So might need an inspection from the well, that, 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 that's a, that, Yeah, that might be the case. The point is, the point is that it's not within our control. The point of having a Section 106 agreement is we would bring even existing manure underneath the control and therefore I do believe that the certainty is increased. I cannot accept that a decent and well, and perhaps there has been delays, I'm no doubt about that, but I do, I cannot accept that a really decent and well researched and well drafted section 106 that puts the onus, we're not here to decide, it's a discretionary decision of an ecologist to make, to make a judgment. And on his judgment, with, with the evidence that was presented to him, and perhaps there wasn't sufficient evidence or sufficient certainty in that section 106 yet, he has not been able to, to reach that certainty. But I cannot accept that a good section 106 that's actually going to re remove existing manure and continue to remove existing manure is not going to provide certainty and not only provide certainty, provide betterment to the catchment. And so I, I, I don't know how to couch that in terms of a decision, but my personal choice would be that grant permission with the, with the section 106 agreement to be agreed. I think that would be a fair way forward. Thank you. Anyway, we have a resolution in front of us. We have to deal with it. That is. Um, Past them, that's not a possibility. Right, we have the resolution that um, the officer's recommendation is adopted. Can I ask those in favour, please show? Right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven in favour. Those against? One, three, four, six against. That is carried, I believe, isn't it? So that resolution is carried. Okay, we'll move on now to item 10 very quickly, bearing in mind the time. Which is fairly dead. This is, um, I don't think the motion has to do you want to stop for this one or? Is that mine? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It, it's based by dint of it. it, it, it wouldn't have normally been at this, but okay. it was by a member of staff. Okay. 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 Oh, okay. Right, we move on now. The application is for 
Earl of Ashwood House, Stoke Prior, Herefordshire, proposed detached garage to include garden room with office, offices above. The, um, the application is here by the committee by dint of being, um, by dint of being a committee staff interest. Mr. Dyer. The case here before members is presented as a committee as the applicant is related to an employee of the council. Otherwise, this would usually be dealt with as a delegated matter. The committee is a detached dwelling located on the northern side of the siege of Bourne 2 at the centre of the village of Stoke Prior. The location is shown by the red star on the map. Next slide, please. Just bear with me a second. The building is sited within a large residential block in the village, as seen edged in red on the display in front of you, in an area characterised by similar detached properties in the immediate vicinity. Next slide, please. The planning permission is sought for the erection of a two storey garden room and office with connected single storey garage slash storage building. This will be sited to the eastern elevation of the main dwelling, further away from the road front than the previously approved outbuilding outlined on the block plan in front of you. Next slide, please. The two story portion of the proposal would be approximately seven metres by five metres, five and a half metres to the ridge height. The attached single story garage element will be to the south of this. At an angle and extend approximately 9.5 metres away from the garden room slash office at its longest point and be approximately 6.2 metres wide. All elements of the structure are proposed to be constructed in materials to match that of the host dwelling. The height of the outbuilding has been considered in terms of its impact on the residential immunity of the neighbouring properties and has already been lowered at the suggestion of the applicant by 500 millimetres, which includes the eave height. This was in order to ensure no material adverse impact on neighbouring immunity. The first floor office is proposed to exclude any windows on the eastern elevation, ensuring no overlooking onto the neighbouring property. Next slide, please. The location of the proposed outbuilding is set back from the road and with the closest neighbouring property located approximately 17 metres away from the proposed location, along with the existing boundary treatments, the impact on the public and residential community as a result is considered minimal. It was raised by the parish council, as seen in paragraph 5.1 of the officer report, that there are currently no provisions for surface water runoff provided within the plans. As such, the inclusion of a pre-occupancy condition for details of a wastewater and drainage management strategy to be approved in writing by the local planning authority is recommended in order to ensure that water quality targets and surface runoff are appropriately managed. In summary, the proposal has been designed and cited to match the character of the main property and its setting within the village. The visual impact is limited due to the location of the proposal within the planning unit, the reduced height and existing boundary treatment surrounding the curtilage. It is considered the proposal will not have any undue impact upon the immunity of the neighbouring residents or the public. The proposal seeks to provide secure storage and extra space to both enjoy the property and effectively work from home. As such, the application is recommended for approval in accordance with the conditions laid out in the officer report. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Dyer. Um, the local member is Councillor Harry. I, I do have some knowledge of it, yes. I just didn't know it was coming today. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, you know, I support it. Um, the parish council was supportive. They were a little bit, as we said, surprised about the initial scale that's been reduced somewhat. And as long as the issues are covered with drainage, um, and there is a condition on it to say it shouldn't be able to attach to the private house. I uh, continue to support it. Councillor Andrews, you would. Yeah, uh, I'm just going to re recommend for approval, support that. When it comes to drainage, if water catchment could be put in the conditions, I think that would help a lot. Um, but I support it, so I move forward to approve the application. Councillor Mill. 
Uh, well, actually, the parish council's support is dependent on there being, as Councillor Harrington said, a condition that this actually quite large, 124 square metres, development can't be used as a separate dwelling. Uh, and that there is no such condition suggested on on the uh, officer's report. So I don't know whether we can have a comment on that. Uh, because at the moment, the parish council's representation can only be taken as an objection. Sorry, can I, can I come back in, Chair? Yeah. yeah. Well, if that recommendation, that condition needs to be approved, I, I will go for that as well. But, so, so the change of, so to, for the applicant to change this annex or outbuilding into a, into a separate dwelling would require planning permission anyway because it would be a material um, change so therefore it would, it would be covered by a separate planning application. And we're content with that, are we? Okay. Well, I mean, I. Yeah. All right. Councillor Shaw. Um, I mean, just just to reinforce what my colleagues are saying, could we not have a condition that that um, new property can't be sold separately to the to the main house? Yes. So you can't. The advice that Mr. Dyer has given you is is, yeah. is absolutely correct, um, but we we can impose a condition. It, 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 it will give some confidence. Yes. Yes. Sold or let, I think. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we've seen too often properties like this suddenly sprouting extra rooms and heaven knows what else without any planning permission at all, and they are ignored and they suddenly turn into new houses. So I think we should not be, uh, we should be sanguine about what we do. I come back to a point I made earlier is you treat all, all applications on their own merits that it would need planning permission were it to be used as a separate independent dwelling but I take the point um, and as I've said we, we can impose um, suitably worded conditions as Councillor Milne and Councillor Andrews have suggested. Bearing that in mind we have a proposal and second for approval. Sorry? Oh sir, did you say who said? Oh, oh Councillor Stone said Right. Uh, do you want to say anything? Or? No, thank you. I, I'm happy with, with the recommendations. Thank you, Chair. Can I then say those in favour, please? No one against, unanimous. Then that is carried.